Well, good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone present and in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices that may interfere with proceedings. Item one is a decision by the committee to take items five, six, seven, and eight in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, we now turn to pre-budget scrutiny, and we have with us today, um, perhaps first of all, Derek Mackay, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, and Jamie Hepburn, who is Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. Uh, welcome to both of you. And with them we have Una Gill, who is Deputy Director for Enterprise and Cities, Gavin Gray, who is Deputy Director of Employability, and Gregor Boyd, who is the Senior Statistician. So I'll now turn to committee members and ask for, first of all, Angela, Angela Constance, sorry, to ask a question. Uh, good morning uh, to, to the panel. Um, the committee has heard evidence from SCVO um, really um, given a very strong critique of employability funds um, actually across the, the piece. Um, claiming that there is no coherence uh, to employability funds and that the context for this is, uh, in essence, that the £600 million pounds that um, is spent on employability in Scotland, uh, whether that's at local government level, Scottish government level, uh, or indeed uh, via the DWP and, and Job Centre Pluses. So I would be uh, keen to hear Mr Hepburn in particular his opinion uh, about that claim. Yeah. Thank you, Kimber. Thanks uh, to Ms. Constance for her, her question. I saw uh, the remarks from uh, Mr. Downey. Um, I think uh, I wouldn't want to go as far to say there's no coherence. That uh, has certain implications. I think, from my view of the landscape that we have uh, across the board, uh, each element of it is doing uh, good work. Uh, each element of it is supporting those it seeks to uh, support. If we're uh, I would concede that Mr Downey uh, has a, a point, is that our system could be more uh, coherent and uh, I would uh, reflect back on the evidence that was provided by no Naomi Eisenstadt, who is of course the First Minister's uh, independent advisor on poverty, when she used, and perhaps again this is a loaded term but I'm using her uh, terminology, she talked about a cluttered landscape in terms of the variety of programmes we have. Again, I would emphasise uh, convener each of them, I think, are, is doing important work. What I believe we can do and what I have set in train, uh, utilising Fair Start Scotland, which is, of course, uh, a new statutory responsibility we have to provide uh, an employment programme, uh, is uh, to take the opportunity to allow us to, to reflect on how we can create uh, a more coherent uh, system. Uh, and that's uh, why I took for the publication of No One Left Behind, which sets out our next steps to ensure greater alignment uh, and integration of the various employment programmes we have, uh, but also, I think just as importantly, uh, better aligning them with other statutory services. We know that a person who is uh, who's quite far removed from the labour market will be no single facet to, uh, to their life experience, so a person could be far removed from the labour market, have issues with their housing circumstance, could have issues to do with their health circumstance, could have caring responsibilities. So we need to make sure that various statutory services are pulling in the same direction as well. So through that piece of work, uh, we are determined to ensure we do have that more coherent system. And as um, some of the, the uh, efforts are in uh, traction, we've got the Integration Alignment Fund, £2.5 million fund, which is funding 13 projects uh, sorry, yes, 13 projects across 18 local authority areas, which is designed to try and test how we can better integrate these uh, services. But also I've uh, made contact with uh, COSLA, who are the main player here um, in terms mm. of uh, investment employability programmes, so that we can begin that dialogue, that serious dialogue, uh, as to how we can uh, have that better integrated system. And of course, DWP has an important role to play as well, and I've uh, been pleased to see a commitment from uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, that she is committed that the DWP will take part in the, the efforts that we are taking forward as well. Okay. Mr Hepburn, you've described how Fair Start Scotland uh, will become more aligned with uh, devolved services, but given that there's three spheres of government uh, involved in here, um, how do you um, 
propose that the ambition for uh, more coherence uh, and a less cluttered uh, landscape across the piece is, is achieved. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that and your relationships with both local government and the UK government. Uh, well, I would, I, we're at the beginning of that process, so what I have done, Ms Constance, is taken the opportunity that Fair Start Scotland has allowed us to... Um, to, to begin that process, so I'm not going to second guess where we end up. We've set out our determination to ensure we have that more uh, aligned system, but it would be wrong for me, I think, to sit here and say before we've engaged with uh, COSLA and the various local authorities uh, and the DWP and indeed the third sector uh, and private providers uh, to have that rounded discussion to, to presuppose what the outcome might be. What I can say is I'm determined that we have a better system as a result of that dialogue. Okay, and so what would your proposition be uh, to your other uh, partners, uh, and in particular to the third sector, who are perhaps feeling a little bit um, <laughs> sidelined? Well, the third sector sh shouldn't feel sidelined. They're a, a, a core part of uh, delivery across the board in Scotland. They are a, an essential delivery uh, partner within Fair Start Scotland, a significant player. Uh, they also are a, a co uh, key partner in terms of other provision. Uh, we provide... £6.1 million pounds for the Community Jobs Scotland programme, which is delivered by the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Uh, this year we're providing £2.5 million pounds to Inspiring Scotland for their 14 to 19 fund. We're working with the Prince's Trust and other partners to better support uh, young people with experience of the care system in their journey to employment. So uh, I certainly uh, don't think it can be said that the third sector isn't an important part of uh, the landscape that we have here uh, in Scotland. In terms of my ambition, um, whilst I would re-emphasise I don't want to presuppose what the whole system would look like after having had that uh, dialogue, what we must ensure is that we have reduced dupli duplication, better understandings. Well, one of the big challenges that we face is that we don't actually know uh, what's happening in, in each area. So. Um, as, as a very starting point, we should at least understand and know what's happening on the ground area by area and make sure that each uh, system can interface with one another better so that a young person, or maybe a not-so-young person, <laughs> can start at one element of the of the provision and move through uh, the process we have, ultimately, we hope, into the world of employment. Mr Hepburn's touched on my, my, my final question. Um, uh, when will we have uh, an up-to-date map uh, on provision across Scotland? Uh, in terms of uh, what we uh, provide directly uh, as an administration, I mean, that's all publicly uh, available. We c we've laid that out. In terms of uh, the, uh, the the entirety of provision across all providers, um, all I could commit to is as soon as possible. I know that's not a wholly satisfactory answer, but uh, given that I have to concede at the outset that I, sitting here, uh, can't tell you what each local authority is uh, providing, I suppose that underlines the necessity of beginning the process. Uh, I want to take that process forward uh, as quickly as possible, and as part of that, we can better map what the service provision is area by area. Okay, thank you. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Just to continue um, looking at the employment support services, how does the budget for um, Fair Start Scotland compare with the previous budget for the UK Work Programme and Work Choice in Scotland? It, well, um, it's uh, that's been a challenge because although we've had the devolution of responsibility and we're taking forward discharging that responsibility, with the devolution of that responsibility came a, a roughly 80% cut uh, in funding. Uh, we estimate that in the last year of DWP provision, they were expending somewhere in the region of between the work programme, work choice, something like 54 million pounds uh, in provision here in Scotland uh, alone. As they've moved to their successor programme, the Working Health Programme, they've drastically reduced investment in that across the UK as a whole, which has had the consequent effect here in Scotland of reduced funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so in uh, the first year uh, that we had uh, responsibility, for example, uh, we had roughly £10 million from the UK government. By uh, my estimation, by the government's estimation, that clearly wasn't going to be sufficient to support enough people. So that's why we took the decision, uh, convener, to leverage in up to an additional £20 million pounds, uh, each year over the lifetime of the contract to Fair Start Scotland. And what influence has this reduced budget had on the design of the Fair Start programme? Um, I mean, it would be... Uh, Clearly, it has had an impact. Um, what I wouldn't want anyone to 
get the sense that this isn't an ambitious programme. <coughs> we have set out an ambition to support at least 38,000 people uh, through our programme, at least 38,000 people through our programme over the three-year referral period and over the five-year operating period of the, the providers that we've provided contracts to. So I think that's a significant amount of people. Clearly, we've had to frame some of our thinking around uh, what is available in terms of expenditure. That's just a, an obvious necessity. Uh, but in terms of our, our wider philosophy that we've taken to approaching uh, the design of the, the service, uh, that's been based on practical experience of the programmes that went before. So, for example, we took the decision to make the programme voluntary because we've heard, I think this Parliament's heard very clearly, significant concern about the uh, efficacy or the lack of e efficacy of the approach taken by sanctioning to support people into employment. We've seen a variety of uh, academic assessments, um, third sector uh, assessment, campaigning organisation assessment that sets out that those who are sanctioned may end up employment, but it will only be for a short period of time before they end up back in the benefit system. That speaks to me of the necessity not to operate a, a system that compels people uh, to take part. We've also taken a view of having a very person-centred system. We've also taken the view that supported employment will be a key part of our provision. The first time that's happened in an employment programme of this scale across these islands. We're also operating an individual placement support uh, model to support those uh, with um, uh, poor mental health challenges. We've also ensured that our providers signed up to the Fair Work Agenda. So it's informed by practical experience and the things that we think are important. And how, how confident are you that there is sufficient budget to get uh, provide the long-term services uh, that people need to get back into the, the, the work, back into the labour market? I mean, how confident are you you can hit the targets of the number of people you want to support? I want to hit the targets. That's our ambition to do so. Uh, clearly, um, the information that we will uh, publish will determine uh, the successful trajectory at Convener. Those are official statistics, so they'll be first available in uh, November for the first two quarters thereafter, available on a quarterly uh, basis. I believe the investment we've leveraged in, this additional investment we've had to leverage in, is sufficient. I believe the approach we're taking is the correct one, and I believe our programme will be a success. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Jamie Halko Johnson. Thanks very much. Good morning to the panel. Um, Minister, of the, the interim schemes, um, like the new First Start Scotland, were voluntary, uh, and there was a quite high drop off in those 40% um, on the Work First programme. That was 40% of people who didn't start the programme, didn't even get to the, kind of the starting block. So I was just wondering how many people actually completed that programme? Um, we had the uh, Five, we had a target of up to 4,800 uh, people to be supported through uh, the lifetime of uh, the, uh, the, the programme referred in. We saw 5,500 people uh, referred in. Uh, the final figures in terms of those who have uh, maintained uh, their place on uh, the programme and had job outcomes is not available yet. That will become available in November. But again, um, you know, this is the first time we've operated that type of uh, programme. Uh, clearly, uh, like any programme, there's going to be mixed success. Uh, my view is that um, overall it was a success in terms of the number of people uh, referred into the programme, uh, in terms of the, uh, the qualitative uh, assessment, certainly in terms of the the feedback I had, I went out and spoke to a, raid, a wide range of people who were participating in the programme convener. Uh, they informed me they thought the programme was well designed. It was far better uh, an experience than uh, those they have, had had previously through DWP administered programmes. Uh, so um, I, I believe we had a successful approach. Clearly we've sought to learn uh, from that. Um, one of the particular challenges, for example, to be quite candid with you, in terms of uh, starts in Workable Scotland, was we hadn't factored in uh, the, uh, well, I was going to say frequency, infrequency um, that the DWP see that particular client cohort. That's not a criticism of the DWP, I should say. Incidentally, it convener, it's probably given that cohort quite correct that they're not requiring them to attend as regularly as others to uh, Job Centre Plus. But we hadn't factored that in, so that was part of the, the learning process. So that's why we've we've tweaked the provision in the Fair Start Scotland. You talk about the, the learning process, SCDI, who are supportive of the voluntary nature of the, of the scheme, um, 
did say that uh, there needs to be more of an investigation of that slip off, slip off, whereby only 60% of the people who volunteered actually started the programme. Obviously, you've talked about the DWP, but are there any other lessons that have been learned from that programme taking forward to the first start, to first start Scotland? Well, ultimately, the lesson that we learned was the fundamental approach we took in terms of the voluntary approach was the correct one. I still firmly take the view, yes, there will be people who disengage from the programme, uh, can that be wholly attributed to it being voluntary in nature? Uh, I very much doubt so. Candidly, will it be for some people? Probably uh, yes. But overall, I still think it's the correct approach. Uh, if you look at the evidence base in terms of, as I laid out earlier, in terms of the approach to securing uh, long-term employment prospects for people through uh, compelling them to take part in programmes, it, it leads me to conclude it's not an effective approach. It also ultimately leads to an approach whereby you know that for, with greater certainty that those taking part actually want to be there. They're there because they view the programme as a, an opportunity rather than a threat to lose the support that they otherwise rely on. So the fundamental lesson I learned was that in taking the voluntary approach, we've, we've got the right one. As I say, the other uh, elements were probably uh, around ensuring that we had a a wider cohort of people that could be supported through Fair Start Scotland. Can I ask, just going back to the budget um, uh, issues that Gordon MacDonald raised, um, you, the, the, the budget £36 million pounds over three years, obviously a five-year... Um, sorry, sorry, £96 million, 30, uh, £30.4 million in the first year. You're looking at 38,000 people to help over the period of this programme, but obviously payment is on certain stages mm -hmm. going through. If every one of those 38,000 people were to complete for all three stages, would that still sit in within that £96 million pound budget? Yeah, well, I suppose I should make the point it's at least 38,000. So at least 38,000. Uh, I, I would hope to exceed that. We, we can't say what the final expenditure will be because um, it's ultimately driven by participation and progression through the model that we've put in place. So, uh, yes, it could be slightly less than that. Ultimately, if um, we have a a fleet uh, of people taking part more, considerably more than we've set out then, it could cost uh, more. That's something that we'll need to factor in uh, at mm -hmm. the time. But have you factored in, say, people that, w won't, that will drop out, as they did with the traditional pro tra transitional programmes? Have you factored in who those that might reach the second stage or the first stage only into those um, uh, calculations? Yes, of course, we've, we've made uh, a calculation in terms of a projection of um, starts at, a cert at each stage of the uh, the, the three-year referral programme, the five-year uh, period for um, for providers to to support people. So yes, there's there's projection of how many people would start, mm -hmm. of how many people would reach each stage in terms of the support. So we have made that calculation. And, are you able and now I, I'm not in a, a place to provide every single element of that detail, but if the committee uh, would like uh, some of that, then we can provide more of that information in writing, convener. Well, it would just be useful how that sits in the budget. If you have the projections, then you'll obviously have the, because the cost is uh, that, uh, set out, and uh, the projection it, on starts. Uh, ultimately, that all was factored into, in terms of the budget that we have we have provided. So you're hoping to meet that, but be round about meeting that budget, or, or, you, or are you um, factoring that it may well be slightly under or slightly over? We want it to be as uh, close to £96 million pounds as possible. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would... Uh, would emphasise that point as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you. Mayor, um, Job Centre Plus is intended to be the, the continuing main referral agency for, the, for Fair Start Scotland. How can the government ensure that the correct people are being referred to its programmes and how can they make sure that people are sufficiently informed about the programme? Uh, we... we um, working on a, a partnership basis ultimately with Job Centre Plus uh, insofar as uh, it comes to uh, referral. That's a new relationship for us to have had to build. So there are um, agreements in place at an operational level, a joint operational framework is it's technical, in aim between um, Scottish Government officials and DWP officials at various uh, levels to ensure that where issues arise, they can meet to try and resolve them. I have to say, an operational, and also there's the, uh, and Ms Constance will know this because um, she has attended them previously as well, the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, where we 
often had to resolve issues uh, uh, as well. Um, sometimes in a slightly different fashion than might have been between uh, officials, but we always managed to, to resolve uh, the issues uh, before us. But on an operational basis, the, uh, the working is good. Um, where issues are identified, they can be uh, taken forward with, uh, uh, with those particular forums that I've referred to between uh, officials and if there's something that needs to be resolved, then it can be resolved. Um, it also allows, there's the conduit between, uh, through the Job Centre Plus, Job Centre Plus work coaches uh, at the ground level identify an issue on uh, their side, they can escalate that through their management, you can bring it to the, the table. Uh, on the uh, other uh, side of providers, those we've provided contracts to identify issues, they can raise that with government officials and they can bring that to the table. Um, I should say, yes, it is the case that Job Centre Plus will, by necessity, uh, because they're in most direct contact, um, certainly in terms of uh, the uh, benefit entitlement, they're clearly in most direct contact with uh, those who stand to benefit by our programme. They will remain the main conduit for referral, but we are actively uh, trying to explore other referral mechanisms as well. We have the opportunity uh, to do so. So, for example, uh, last week, I think it was just last week, uh, I went to uh, launch something called uh, the Navigator Toolkit. It's the violence reduction unit that uh, the uh, that Police Scotland operate based in accident and emergency. These are individuals, they're called navigators, who will identify uh, people who've come into a &E through um, uh, violence, through criminal behaviour. They will seek to engage with them to try and provide them wider support. And we're trying to make sure employability supports an element of that. And as a result of um, that joint work, one of the, the areas was the, the reason was there was to launch this toolkit that navigators could utilise. Essentially, a publication they can look through the various elements of sources of support so they can refer any person on. And one of the things that's come out of productive discussion is trying to ensure that uh, they as individuals, for example, could directly refer people into Fair Start Scotland. So we're not going to just rely on Job Centre Plus, we're going to try and expand that out as well. Do you think that uh, Job Centre Plus, or are you satisfied that Job Centre Plus have a sufficiently robust system for ensuring that the correct people are being referred? Um, well, clearly the committee will uh, well understand the Scottish Government's concerns about the manner in which the Department of Work and Pensions administers the social security system. Um, I've already referred to sanctions. But on a ground level, um, having had the opportunity to go out, and I'll continue this process, I've had the opportunity to go to um, Stirling, Inverness and Lerwick job centres. I've been very impressed with the enthusiasm by which Job Centre Plus work coaches have embraced Fair Start Scotland. Um, they like the system, they like what we've put in place, and they are uh, taking the opportunity to refer people in, talk them through the process, work with uh, those that we've put in place as uh, providers to ensure that uh, it can be as seamless a process as possible, that their uh, client group can be referred into Fair Start Scotland. Clearly, um, it's not going to be uniform. The referral rates will be higher at some job centres and lower at others. And again, one of the benefits of the approach we've taken is we can drill right down into that information and uh, work with Job Centre Plus here in Scotland, work with the DWP to ensure that we're getting as many referrals as possible across all job centres in Scotland. Do you think that the definition of a successful outcome should be widened? You know, not just a sustained job outcome. I think um, one of the th things that we that we have an opportunity to do through uh, the No One Left Behind uh, agenda that I set out uh, earlier in respons response to uh, Angela Constance uh, is that we can begin to look at where uh, elements of the system might be able to take a different approach. So I think for Fair Start Scotland, it's the right approach. I think if we're leveraging a £96 million pounds of investment for an employment programme, I want to see as many people, uh, ideally everyone, but in recognition of reality, it won't be everyone, but as many people as possible engaged in that programme, ending up in employment and sustaining that employment, that would be a good outcome. Uh, going back to the point I made earlier about having greater coherence in the system, I think there probably is a role to be played for other uh, parts of the system to have slightly different outcomes, and that could be 
uh, not necessarily ultimately ending up in employment, but being closer to employment. Indeed, uh, perhaps transitioning into something like Fair Start Scotland. So that's um, an opportunity we now have through the work that uh, I've laid out that we'll take forward through the No One Left Behind agenda. And that's something I'll be very keen to discuss with COSLA, uh, with the DWP and with all the other partners I mentioned earlier. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, continuing from where Colin Beattie was, uh, we've had slightly different evidence, I think, from um, different witnesses uh, and on this subject, I don't think I like the phrase, but anyway, parking and creaming, which I think means that the people who are more difficult to get into a job would be parked, and the people who are easier to get into a job would be got into a job, and therefore the programme provider would get the results, get the money more easily. W what's your reaction to that? What's your feeling about that area? That's certainly a, a concern that was expressed through the, the process of um, of considering how we would design our service. Uh, incidentally, I don't think that's what any of our providers want to do. They want to support those who engage with the programme into uh, employment, and they want to be reaching out to ensure as many people as possible engage in the programme. It's in their interest to do so, because one of the elements and one of the ways we responded to that concern was, of course, by ensuring that there was an upfront uh, fee when a person engages with the programme. The provider will get 30% of the overall value of uh, the fee that uh, they will be entitled to um, for uh, for someone participating, they'll be able to get that up front, again to reduce the concerns about uh, parking uh, and creaming, which as Mr Mason does I have a, a distaste for as a, a terminology, but it's the terminology that has been used. So that's one of the ways we're, we're seeking to respond. Of course, we also have a tiered approach in terms of um, the intensivity of uh, support that might be required for uh, each individual. So it's not like every person who walks through the, the proverbial uh, door, or the literal door in some cases, to engage with uh, Fair Start Scotland will be treated the same. It's very much a person-centred uh, model, and we've provided funding within that model to uh, explicitly recognise where a person might require more support to get into employment then that can be accessed within the, the full funding we've provided. So that's why, for example, uh, we have the individual placement support uh, model that I referred to earlier for those who might be suffering from, from poor mental health. So that's all in place to try and mitigate and work yes. against that concern. I mean, the, the Employment-Related Employment Related Services Association, they actually said that you are targeting at those who are furthest away from the labour market. Right. So, in fact, they're saying there are not people who are going to be easy to get into a job anyway. I mean, do you agree with that statement? Yes, I mean, by it, it, it's very nature, those who... Well, I suppose I'd go back to the, the point I made. There will be some people who engage with our service who will transition to employment more seamlessly than others. We want those people to engage with our service as well, but ultimately the people who stand to benefit most by our service are those who are furthest removed from the labour market. Those are the people we want to, to reach out to. Um, I, I saw Ms McHugh's uh, evidence, I think I detected from her, I think I picked up from her, and I'm sure if I've picked up wrong, she'll inform the committee, but I think she was making the point that the effort that we'd put into designing our programme was uh, exactly uh, to that end, um, and that's the, that's the we want to that's the direction of travel we want to see with the programme we put in place. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Um, I wonder whether I could rattle through some questions with the Minister and start by asking specifically about the Employability Fund. Um, I understand Fair Start contracts are for three years, but Employability Fund are for one year. Um, why is that? And would you change that to bring certainty and stability to the training providers? Well, our training providers are obviously integral to the success of any of our uh, training programmes. What I will say, and I think Ms Bailey and any member of this committee would expect me to say, and I'm sure they would share this expectation, our programmes are designed around the needs of the participants, and ultimately they have to be the uh, those who um, are, are most important. In terms of uh, the point that uh, Ms Bailey makes, uh, convener, I suppose the fundamental difference is, and I've 
made um, that quite clear in the answers to some questions before, especially Mr Mason's just a, a few moments ago. The reason that Fair Start Scotland contracts are for a longer period of time is that the people who participate in that programme, uh, many of them are going to require a much longer period of support that will take longer than a year. The Employability Fund's designed in a, a very different way. That's designed to support people over a, a shorter, sharper uh, period of, of time rather than over many years. So by its nature, it's a, a different type of of system. The other point, of course, I would make is having just set out that we've begun the, the journey to, to look at a, a more effective uh, system. I, I wouldn't propose at this stage to, to radically alter elements of the system we have in place just now. But of course, that's all part of the dialogue we'll have. And if it's felt to be um, an issue of, of um, significant concern, then it's incumbent on us to, to at least listen to that. We might not draw the same conclusion, but of course, we'll always be willing to listen to, to any concerns that are raised. Okay. The budget for the Employability Fund has gone from almost £34 million in 2015-16 to £19 million in 2017-18, a drop of £15 million, which is a 44% cut. Could you explain that? Um, well, the Employability Fund was put in place uh, at a time uh, where the labour market was very different from what it is just now. So um, if you look back at the the period when the employability fund was first instigated, youth employment or youth unemployment levels, I should say, convener, were running significantly in excess of where we are uh, today. Thankfully, we've travelled much uh, further. So, in terms of uh, investment in specific programmes, they, they largely uh, reflect uh, reflect the the, um, the the place we're in just now. What I can say, and going back to the um, the point that uh, Jackie Bailey made in terms of trying to offer as much assurance and stability to train providers as we can over each of the last three years in terms of the uh, openly procured element of the employability fund, uh, there's been uh, stability in terms of funding and the number of places. Um, I wonder whether you'd comment on what the overall budget has been, because there was a report um, by consultants in thirteen fourteen saying that the total spend across all employability oh, programmes yes was about 660 yep. million. Um, but in evidence, both the STUC and S SCVO thought it was quite a bit below that. Um, do you have a global figure for what you spend on employability funds across the board? Uh, well, we can say what we spend, the 660 million pounds figure, which came around as um, the, uh, the analysis of the uh, Cambridge consultants, which if I recall correctly, we, we actually put in place uh, in terms of trying to analyse and understand what the level of expenditure uh, was. The lion's share, the vast majority, was through uh, local authorities. So uh, I can't, candidly, I can't sit here and say what the definitive figure is right now. But again, that will be part of the discussion we have with with COSLA and with other partners as we, we move forward. Um, so candidly, so you I can't tell you what the figure is right now. Would you repeat the exercise, though, to ensure we do get a better yeah, I, I would. I would certainly consider uh, doing so. I suppose we'd need to engage with uh, COSLA first of all. I'm not, um, mm -hmm. I'm not one that will uh, initiate uh, consultants without necessity. Um, if we can get the information more readily for, by, by direct engagement with COSLA, then we'll get the information. If they come back to us and say that is a piece of work that might be helpful, then of course we'll consider it. Great. Thank you, convener. Um, now, questions from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. This is on the enterprise agencies. Yes. Oh. Yeah. yes. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, thanks to uh, ministers for um, coming along. I want to turn to the uh, enterprise agencies now that we're doing pre budget scrutiny of. We've heard claims about um, jobs that have been created both by um, the intervention of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and um, Scottish Enterprise. We've also heard economic uh, analysis by Scottish Enterprise about every pound they spend um, resulting, generating between six to nine pounds of gross value added. Um, are those figures that the Scottish Government um, recognises and do you do any independent scrutiny of these figures? Okay, thank you, convener. Uh, can I say this? I think this is my first time appearing before you as Economy Secretary, and I welcome that opportunity. And just before I turn to the very specific question, as it is my first appearance, um, I'd want to say I found the 
the letter from the committee very helpful in terms of your report into the performance of Scotland's economy, and I've given a response to that. And I think it gives us a lot of opportunities to work together going forward, and my response covers the consensual approach that I hopefully want to take in the economy. And the committee can judge for themselves whether my appointment and or the publication of your report has helped contribute to the turn of economic indicators over the course of the summer, uh, which of course have been largely welcomed. Or it could be neither of us, of course, responsible for any of that. Uh, but in any event, I appreciate uh, the focus on the economy. Specifically in relation to the uh, question, we expect validation by the enterprise agencies uh, around the reports that they give on the uh, economic benefits, the jobs that they create, the economic uh, return for investment. But there was, as it happened a few years back, uh, an analysis by Audit Scotland into that uh, kind of work. We don't, we don't audit every single uh, comment that the enterprise agencies would make, but there is an expectation, of course, that the claims they make around the added economic uh, uh, outputs that they bring are, of course, uh, accurate and uh, can be proven. Now, there is challenge between the civil service and enterprise agencies, the board, the chief executive, and myself as well, of course, uh, and further focus on that as we address the uh, direction to the enterprise agencies every year. I think there will be some opportunities, such as the high-profile um, announcement about Barclays uh, going to Glasgow, specifically 2,500 jobs being mentioned, where clearly uh, th that has to be delivered. You'd want that to be delivered, and those numbers would be proven by how many people they ultimately employ. So we don't have an extra bureaucracy on top of our own accountability, the enterprise agency's accountability. But I think there's a range of checks and balances that assure us that how we are investing in them is achieving the economic outputs that they claim. So you mentioned an Audit Scotland report a few years ago. Was that a generic report? What did, exactly I, did that do? Uh, yeah, I can ask my official uh, Una Gill to, to cover more of the content of that. Uh, yes, indeed. It was um, a, a review of the enterprise agencies, um, I think three or four years ago, the Audit um, Scotland undertook. So, I mean, it's clear when <coughs> Scottish Enterprise, for example, um, attract Barclays to invest in Glasgow, that's, that's high profile, there's job numbers, and that will be, be scrutinised uh, quite, quite closely. Um, but every year they're making evaluations of the number of jobs they've supported that without their intervention wouldn't exist. I wonder if there's an opportunity to invite Audit Scotland, this is just one option here, to actually scrutinise one year's budget and to drill down on these claims and see of what they're based on, because uh, one economist uh, based in Inverness, Tony Mackay, um, has suggested that highs figures are uh, very exaggerated. It, to be clear, convener, um, for ministerial responsibility, Scottish Enterprise report to me, Highlands and Islands Enterprise report to Fergus Ewing specifically, um, but as a general point, I'd expect the numbers to be uh, robust. Now, the one thing I've learned about economists is they um, they, are, of course, are forecasting into the future and can even revisit the past. And the thing I've learned is they uh, really all absolutely uh, agree on, on the forecast. I've no reason to believe that the um, results that the enterprise agencies present to us are in any way inaccurate. If the committee wants to explore that further, I'll certainly consider that. But I wouldn't want... Um, an extra layer of bureaucracy on top of the actions that we're trying to collectively de uh, deliver to, to grow our economy. But if there's any concerns that the committee has, I'm happy to look at you know, any example where you feel that the, the presentation or the outputs haven't been validated. But we believe through our checks and balances, uh, through our challenge and, and through the range of work that, that we do, that the numbers that we, that we get are credible. Uh, and when, we, when big announcements are made, the proof of the pudding's in eating. You know, if a commitment's made around how many jobs are going to be created, well, let's look back at how many jobs were created then. And in the conditionality of financial support, sometimes or often the, the drawdown levels, the point at which any company can, can draw down the support that's been committed is conditional based uh, on those conditions being met. And that may well be job numbers or economic return. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. 
Um, last week I was asking both Scottish Enterprise and HIE um, about their performance targets because they had both met absolutely every target that they had, which struck me as slightly surprising because in other sectors like health and education, we sometimes meet some targets and we sometimes miss others. So that made me think, and I think other people think, are their targets too easy and how are they being set? Now, linked in with that, I was asking about the strategic board and if it would have a role in these specific targets. Now, both of them answered broadly that, no, they, they didn't think the strategic board would have a role in that, but that, in fact, the strategic board would just be at a much kind of higher level. So, I'm basically, I was wanting to ask your comment on that area. Do you think the performance targets have been a bit too easy in the past? And would the strategic board be a vehicle for really kind of clamping down on them? It Mr Mason asked a good question. I, I wouldn't say that the performance targets have been too easy, but on the other hand, I expect us to be able to do more. More because there are opportunities there. We, as the committee has requested, are recalibrating our economic strategy. So the range of actions that we'll put in place hopefully will get uh, even more value from the investment that, that we're making. Fundamentally, the question around the performance targets, although we set out in the a strategic uh, direction, what's the expectation of uh, ministers, and clearly the enterprise agencies produce that uh, report. Uh, we want to get maximum value, and where the strategic board I think will be helpful is not adding a new list of targets, but actually having a more consistent framework uh, through which we can judge the performance of the enterprise agencies, because yes, each agency, of course, we've got Highlands and Islands, Scottish Enterprise, and then South of Scotland emerging as well. Um, and there is an issue about how they judge uh, their performance that we can then address through the strategic board, bringing it all together, the funding council, Skills Development Scotland, the enterprise uh, agencies, to have a more consistent framework as to how we analyse their performance. So it won't be another layer of performance targets on top of it, but more consistency in how we challenge and rate the enterprise agencies compared to each other, whilst recognising the regional and local differences within. Let's all bear in mind that the strategic board was meant to have a more cohesive and aligned approach to skills and enterprise. Mm. Not more divided, not more fractious, not more um, layers of bureaucracy, but more cohesion. But in bringing that together, then I think there is that opportunity to be more challenging around performance eh, and that monitoring framework without adding any extra layer of bureaucracy. And I think that does speak to the point around them being able to have a uh, indicators that, 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 that might suit any individual enterprise agency, but what works for, for us all. I mean, I mean, can I just try again? I mean, I, I think I'd be more comfortable if they met nine out of ten of their, their uh, targets, because then I'd feel that they were doing pretty Rather well. Ten out of ten, convener. Yes, mm. because um, then, then I would feel that, yes, they were do, doing pretty well, nine out of ten, 90 percent is a pretty good result, but clearly if they, if they failed to meet one, that would uh, show that it was challenging. And I just, my fear is with this 10 out of 10, 100% record, that it's not challenging enough. Do, do you not have any, uh, do you have any agreement with that? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to direct the enterprise agencies to start failing on their objectives well, to make know, Mr. Well, okay, Mason okay, feel okay. more okay. comfortable. <laughs> I suppose the point that I was trying to make is that I, I do believe that the, that the performance statistics are challenging. The, um, ministerial direction is clear, but the wider objectives, we know we want to do better on the performance of Scotland's economy. We know that the enterprise agencies have to contribute to that. We've got a range of financial tools we can use to do that. We know the big challenges around uh, research, development, innovation, future technology, productivity and all of that. So I think we all need to push them, and I th I'm accepting that point. And there's a range of ways in which we can do that. But there, there has to be some satisfaction in the fact that performance targets and milestones have been met. I accept the point, though, that we should make sure that it's challenging enough to push them to maximise the opportunities for the Scottish um, economy. And I think the Strategic Board is helping us do that. One of the key outcomes of the Strategic Board so far is it's bringing greater alignment across the public sector, the enterprise agency, skills, funding council, um, working uh, more cohesively together, and that will mean challenge between them as well. 
So I, I, I think that, if, that will bring the benefits. But equally, we know that we want to grow Scotland's economy and we will have to push the, 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 the enterprise agencies so to do it as well. And if that means you know, sharpening up some of the performance targets, so be it. But I want to go on with the job rather than be relying on extra bureaucracy, frankly. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, convener. Um, we heard last week about a £13 million underspend in financial transaction money from Scottish Enterprise, £10 million of which was SE's contribution to the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Fund. Um, that was a promise, as the Cabinet Secretary may recall, of £200 million in equity investment in a previous programme for government. So, nothing of the £40 million was spent in the first year, 17-18, we hear that there's one project of one million in this year. Um, given that there's 80 million allocated to this year, how much do you think will actually be spent? I want to put the whole Scottish growth scheme into context. It's an umbrella for a range of financial packages that we have debated before. Um, and I suppose we've not had the, I've not had the opportunity to discuss that fully. Um, with the committee directly. A on announcement in the uh, 2016 programme for government for delivery or implementation starting from financial year 17-18 and then over a three-year period. Uh, the announcement we had envisaged was looking at a range of financial tools to support and stimulate that private sector growth. Now, frankly, we had envisaged um, more use of guarantees. Now, guarantees have been used by... Um, uh, the government, but not to the scale that we had anticipated. Um, there wasn't necessarily the demand in the private sector for the use of guarantees. Therefore, of course, grants are popular. You know, if enterprise agencies offer people a choice in the hierarchy of which financial products would you like, would you like grant support, loans or equity or guarantees, then people will opt uh, for the others. Um, so it appears that... Um, Equity has been more successful uh, so far, um, guarantees less so. And we did work with the, the British Business Bank, who do some work in this area, and they, they you know, didn't find a huge appetite for that kind of product. So what we've been doing is having bespoke solutions to ensure that we can commit and deliver on the commitment to the half a billion pounds of extra financial support that was announced. Now, over the three-year period, because again, you have to look at it as a package, I do believe that the three-year commitment will be fulfilled. But I think it means we have to respond to what the private sector wants and what they are choosing uh, to take up as the most popular products. Many of these European uh, co-investment uh, programme and other funds, of course, take some time to develop. Uh, the private sector works up their proposition, maybe works with other uh, co-investors to see if there's that investor interest. So some of them may well take time. Uh, maybe not in one financial year, but over the three-year period, I believe that will fulfil that half a billion pounds support. And we'll adapt the products that are more uh, popular and are actually delivering the economic growth. So although some of the schemes have not, as I say, had the uptake that we would have wanted, we are close to about £100 million overall. And I can check the most recent figure for the, all the funds within the Scottish Growth Scheme eh, to see how we, we think we can deliver that trajectory for the three-year period. Uh, but Jackie Bailey's right. Some products have been more successful than others. And even where other investors, co-investors are required, um, they take some time to be developed. So I just wanted to give that answer in the round. OK, I wonder whether I could take you back to the specifics I asked, which is, you know, £80 million for what is probably the biggest chunk of the growth fund's money. Um, and so far, we have one company at £1 million. Given that it only has... We're halfway through the financial year. It only has another year to run. Are you telling the committee that that fund will be fully spent or are you going to change it? And if so, how? Well, I suppose what I'm saying is we will respond to demand. There'll be some um, projects that are under consideration. But what I want to make sure is the half a billion pounds committed to is delivered in terms of all the products that we have. If any okay. individual element is underused for whatever reason, then I don't want to see any money lost to Scotland. So, so we will use the resources at our disposal. As to each strand of that, if it's less popular, I mean, I've pointed out 
that sure. guarantees, we envisage quite a lot of guarantees sure. being used as contingent liability. It may never have crystallised into a financial cost to the government. Recognising that that wasn't as popular, we've used other financial tools to ensure that still, no matter what, that support's given to the private sector. So I don't know at this stage, but I'm trying to be helpful to Jackie Bailey, because I know she appreciates me trying to be helpful. Absolutely. Always, Cabinet if, Secretary. If we don't deliver on the £80 million for whatever yep. reason... Yep then I will look at making sure we can still deliver on the overall half a billion pounds support Excellent. through whatever financial products are working for the private sector. And in order for me to be equally helpful to the Cabinet Secretary, <laughs> could he tell me what other financial products beyond the um, Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Fund are part of the growth scheme and how are they performing? Uh, the SME Holding Fund has been quite successful, uh, for example. Um, that's been equity that's been used quite successfully. Um, now, I can ag again get specifics to Jackie Bailey or to the committee on where we're at right now, uh, recognising that as each month passes, uh, more companies will benefit. Uh, but in terms of what I have, uh, there's been an allocation of some £97.3 million in equity investment made to 79 companies, for example. So I can share more information uh, with the committee that overall. Would that would indeed be yeah, helpful. But, but I make the point again that if a fund has not been used, I think it is important to say well, what other products is there more demand for and we can ensure that those are absolutely maximised so that we can deliver that headline commitment that we set out by the First Minister. OK, speaking of maximising budgets and, and meeting headline commitments, um, education is this government's top priority, yet we have an underspend from last year um, reported just last week of £115 million in education and skills. As the new economy secretary, I'm sure you would agree that any reduction in investment, for whatever reason, in educational performance and skills has a direct impact on the economy. It, but again, if we look at some of the budget lines, um, and I don't have all that information in front of me right now, but some of the lines within the budget will be demand-led. So, for example, uh, education maintenance allowance is, is demand-led. So if a budget is underspent there, it's because people haven't necessarily applied for it as to, opposed to, to, to any other reason. I do agree, though, that having invested such a massive increase in enterprise and skills, uh, that we want to ensure that that resource is spent to try and encourage and stimulate the economy. It's a substantial commitment around um, enterprise. Uh, and uh, uh, education, of course, we would want that to be spent. If I go back to a um, specific question on the budget that Jackie Bailey asked about, um, of course, the enterprise agencies, including financial transactions, saw an increase in the 2018-19 budget, a substantial increase, and a lot of that was financial transactions that we have been able to use for equity investment. Uh, but that is a substantial increase from... Uh, 35 million up to 68.5 million pounds. So I just want to put that figure of underspend in context as well. I don't think I asked that question, convener, but you let, asked me about put, financial let me just put some context so. as well. I mean, financial tra that transaction money, as we know, is loan funding and equity funding. Um, but actually, if you look at SE's core grant, it's reduced by something like 27% um, over the last five, six, seven years, um, which is unfortunate given the importance of growing the economy. just thought I'd put that on record too. Well, convener, to be put, put it on the record. The increase was 24.68% increase in the budget. Yes, financial transactions was part of that, but actually loans and equity is part of a core function of Scottish enterprise and how we grow the economy. So that increase was welcomed. I think I've made my point, convener. I think, I think you both have. <laughs> <laughs> We'll move on to Dean Lockhart. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to our panel. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, follow up on the Scottish growth scheme. Uh, if you look at the Scottish Enterprise uh, website, uh, decisions on the European co-investment programme, uh, the investment decisions are made by the private fund manager, not by the Scottish Government or by Scottish Enterprise. So how can the Scottish Government ensure that money is being invested in a way that is consistent with the Scottish Government policy uh, or economic policy of inclusive growth? Well, 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, the policy is to, to grow the economy, and not only will we use Scottish Government resource to do that, we're happy to look at investment pots elsewhere, and it, it seems reasonable to look at European funds to do that as well. So, of course, we would expect our, um, our inclusive growth policies to be followed, um, but we have provided additional support and resource to take any applicant from Scotland through the system. Of course, we want more um, positive results here, but we are in the hands of those propositions that have been developed, those who are making co-investment decisions as well, uh, the support that Scottish Enterprise uh, provides to companies. And then I would revert back to the point that even if we're not successful in this scheme, but we want to be, then I'm trying to make sure that we still provide that half a billion pounds extra support to the private sector over the three-year period. Um, thanks for that. Just looking at the numbers, the half a billion pounds um, target was set out two years ago with a three-year uh, uh, target period. Um, roughly speaking, do you have a number as to how much has, in total, has been spent or invested under the Scottish Growth, growth Scheme as, as, we, as we sit right now? Yeah, it's a fair uh, question, Convener. As I understand, uh, at this point in time, it is roughly £100 million that's been invested. But that's why I committed to write to the committee, because that number changes week to week, month to month. But I'm happy to get that figure. Um, to the uh, committee, uh, recognising that it's not necessarily just a linear approach, that there might be some big investments, there might be some big success stories in terms of propositions that are put forward. But overall, I'm, I'm confident on the trajectory that I've seen so far that we will uh, achieve that half a billion pounds figure over the three-year period in the time scales that I've given in an earlier question. Okay, just to follow up, thank you for that. So we're two years in, 100 million, roughly 100 million pounds being invested, obviously leaving 400 million balance, which would, under the original target, leave 400 million to be spent this year in the following 12 months, if you look at the original three-year target. Is that original three-year target still, you're shaking your head, I assume that well, I original three-year target is, is not being met. Uh, if that three-year target is not being met, what's the new time frame for the 400 million pounds to be spent? And if I may, add one other question. Um, will the following budget uh, allocate and provide for that additional £400 million? So I think the, the timescale that I gave to Jackie Bailey earlier is the accurate one. The, the, the headline commitment was in the programme for government in a 2016. The schemes were to begin in 2017-18 um, financial years. Um, and so it's over 17-18 uh, 18, 19, 19, 20, um, and recognising that some of the schemes were in place um, after the year, financial year began in 2017-18, that's the time scales that I'm working to. Uh, some, again, some of the investment propositions will take some time, they'll work through the system and they may, you know, substantially come at one point, but that's the time scale I'm working to, and the information I have is that we should be able to deliver that half a billion pounds extra support over that period. What I've tried to do, and, and, and Dean Lockhart understands the private sector, if certain elements aren't as popular or aren't working as well, you recalibrate the elements that are, and that's what we've been trying to do to make sure that we give the support where it's required. Uh, and the element that we set out with at the start was around some of the use of guarantees. As I say, they have been used in part for some mm. uh, substantial investments. Uh, that, was only a, that would only ever crystallise as a cost to government if there was, um, a, a, as a contingent liability, a call on that resource. So that element wasn't as popular, which is why we're focused on the other elements. And we worked with the banks to, to test out the appetite mm. for that particular product. And of course, all this builds towards the Scottish National Investment Bank, where we're looking at the current financial tools we've got and what new financial tools we'll have going forward, including the Building Scotland funds, the precursor to the capitalisation of the bank, to see what additionality we can provide to stimulate and support the, the private sector. Mm. And I think that will show the momentum around generally uh, government support for, for stimulating the economy. Thank you. Uh, one final question, if I may. Um, I'm very pleased the Cabinet Secretary had time to read the uh, Economy Committee's report on the performance of uh, Scotland's economy. He will have read the conclusions that um, all seven of the national performance targets uh, relating to the economy uh, were not met, had not had the, the Scottish Government targets had, been, uh, had failed to meet those targets. The programme for government this year announced a new economic action plan to be announced, I believe, at the end of this month. Will that set out new economic targets uh, under the Scottish Government's economic policy? Uh, no, I don't envisage it setting out new targets. I think, 
I think the first of all, I thought it was a very helpful contribution from the committee uh, in terms of the analysis of the economic uh, performance uh, that we have been experiencing. Of course, there have been you know, major issues in the Scottish and the UK economy, the oil and gas uh, downturn before that, where there was a, a, a financial crash. And we know the issues around productivity as well. The question is, how do we address them? Now, I know for some time many members of the committee had been asking us to revisit our economic strategy, and that's what uh, we have done. We've revisited the economic strategy, but I think what's important is what are the actions that can be delivered to provide stability, stimulate the economy, and the sustainability uh, for our economy as well. So I think it's the actions, uh, some of which were in the programme for government, some of the key uh, pillars of our economic strategy, looking at them, what more can we do to, to grow the economy? And of course we want to meet uh, the indicators that we've set out in the national performance framework um, that uh, <coughs> I, I led that process uh, within uh, government. Of course, in the very purpose of government and wider than just government, uh, we've got the inclusion of well-being and we've got inclusive and sustainable economic growth. That was, that was what was sought after uh, throughout our consultation, cross-party approach, and there was a great deal of engagement in the performance targets, in the inc outcomes and the indicators. But what we know we have to do is accelerate the growth in our economy, deliver greater fairness, and there's a range of actions we need to undertake to deliver on that. And, convener, I was slightly light-hearted when I made the reference about the economic indicators, but I think it is worth making the point, of course, that we have, over the period of devolution, made progress on productivity. Uh, exports are, 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 are up. There's a sharp increase in exports, but we know that we've got more to do uh, in internationalisation, on innovation, more to do, and that's why we're investing in innovation hubs. We're supporting uh, greater collaborative working between our uh, universities and the private sector, for example. We're investing in National Investment Bank. We're investing in National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. And on business support, Scottish Enterprise is recalibrating their efforts around business support. So these are actions, actions that will feature uh, in the Economic Action Plan, uh, some of which have been uh, announced in the programme for government, because our objective is to do more around exports and deliver the inclusive growth agenda, scale up, um, and of course, in terms of the engagement with businesses, respond to what businesses have been asking for. Yes, some of that's a competitive tax environment, mm -hmm. but actually the, the number one issue that was raised with me over the course of the last few months was skills. And so that's a number of people, and productivity, all the more, so, so in skills, all the more reason to work together on the strategic board, on the funding council, Skills Development Scotland, and through the enterprise agencies being able to feed in what business and industry needs are. So those are the range of actions, some of which featured in the Economy Committee's report. Yeah, and I've looked at it as a, you know, a commission member on the Growth Commission as well, engage with business, see what are the actions that are required to help grow our economy so that we can meet mm. those performance targets. Mindful of there are events out with our control that affect our country's economic performance, I've touched on some of the previous ones, and the most immediate one, frankly, convener facing us right now is the uncertainty of Brexit. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I thought the, the member might want me to pause at that no, point. No, that, that's fine. I, I just One of the other recommendations in, in the committee <laughs> report, and let me I, I know we're uh, running out of time, in, in the context of evidence-based policy, the committee yeah. encouraged the Scottish Government to make uh, the targets, to, to look at reinstating targets, because as, as the, as the um, Audit Scotland report said, and to enterprise agency, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It. So we would encourage you in the new economic action plan to look at some specific targets as opposed to having a very generic approach to the economy. But convener, I, I, I will. I, will. I think, sorry if I might interrupt, I think if we're referring to we, are we referring to the committee now? And, uh, it was in, a committee in recommendation. That, well, indeed, in that, in that case, perhaps uh, I might intervene and um, uh, ask both of you to pause, having, I think, both made your points. Um, unless the, uh, well, in fact, I think we're, we're out of time. So if I might just deal with two oh. points very briefly. Um, and uh, Cabinet Secretary, the Scottish Government um, in its programme for government mentioned increased conditionality attached to some future business support. Now, with reference to the inclusive growth agenda, I just want to ask, what is the emphasis going to be then on the fair work criteria or growth potential? 
or how is that going to be addressed, the balance between these two in terms of Convener, I think it's a, a fair question that conditionality has been um, debated for some time um, and what was announced in the programme for government is that we would look at that conditionality in relation to the uh, RSA. So that's essentially the Scottish Enterprise um, grants. What we're looking at including specifically is the fair work criteria including paying the living wage excluding exploitative zero hours contracts and being transparent on gender equal pay to business support grants to say through the RSA. So that's the territory that we're looking at and we've said it uh, will be in place for the grants from 2019-20 onwards. Uh, I would invite the committee though, uh, in partnership with me, to think further, uh, and I certainly know Andy Whiteman has an interest in this, has raised it uh, in another committee and Jackie Bailey certainly raised it in the chamber, conditionality might not just stop at RSA. Where further should we consider conditionality and the principles that we hold and other levers uh, the government has? But, but that's what's been announced in the PG, uh, uh, programme for government, and that, therefore, is what we wish to take forward with our enterprise agencies. Uh, and how important, how important is growth potential or actual results in terms of uh, jobs created and so forth? Well, if we are... Of course, if, I think in the past the debate's been about the, the trade-off. It's good to get the jobs and the economic growth. What we are saying is we want to deliver that inclusive growth, that fair work agenda is really important, and therefore we want the jobs to be compliant with those principles, and that is a progression from where we were before. So, of course, economic growth is, is important. Um, the point I was going to finish on with Mr Lockhart, of course, the committee will welcome that our GDP is now outperforming the UK GDP uh, statistics, so we are outperforming the United Kingdom in growth. But we want it to be fair and inclusive growth, and that's what our conditionality uh, will try uh, and achieve. Well, uh, I'll resist the temptation to bring Mr Lockhart back in <laughs> to um, comment on that point. Um, and if I could just ask you to focus on the specific question that I'm asking, you know. This is a further matter, and I hope uh, you don't think of me as an economist wishing to revisit the past, because I don't think this matter's been tied up, so to speak, yet. Um, you'll be aware of the, the data inquiry report of the committee, and I think in a, possibly in a previous guise, you yourself, Cabinet Secretary, responded on that. Um, I just want to focus on, on one issue because there are a number of outstanding issues and I think we're still waiting as a committee to hear from the Scottish Government and that's on pre-release access and really the question is very simple. Um, are you going to um, respond by doing what the majority of the committee wanted? I'm not sure that we even have a response properly speaking to the minority view. Um, in this new sort of uh, spirit of consensus, are you hoping to bring the Scottish Government approach to this in the interest of transparency, public trust and openness into line with what is applied in the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, uh, Convener, um, in the interest of consensus, I think I've given you a very comprehensive report to your um, economic performance <coughs> uh, considerations. In relation to other matters, I understand I've uh, written uh, and responded to your previous letter. In specific relation to this, no, I don't propose to change the government's uh, uh, position. If you want a straightforward answer, and I'm happy to debate that with you. I understood that you might want to explore this issue here and now. I can put it in writing why I'm not proposing to change uh, the government's position. I think the government is transparent, is accountable. There have been no accusations or reasons to revisit our uh, handling of uh, statistics. The professional community hasn't asked us to. There are no concerns from the, the statisticians. Um, I understand that a majority view and a minority view in government. I have had no evidence whatsoever to lead me to the conclusion that we should not have um, a, a well-informed, accurate um, understanding of statistics when they're being released. Now, I it looked back at the history of this issue when the previous order was made and there was no party politics at the time, there was no division in the committee on the legislation that we currently rely upon, none, uh, and I've had no evidence as to why the government should change our position and the statisticians equally are not uh, requesting a change, they're happy with the current arrangements 
Um, and I can go through a range of other arguments well, as to market, market sensitivity and so on. Um, but no, convener, I don't see any reason to change our current position on the system. Well, I was, I was hoping you might um, suggest coming down the road to meet us halfway, perhaps, on it or something, or a willingness or openness uh, to do that on the basis of some of the evidence which was given to the committee, which was unanimous. And I think things have moved on since the previous order was issued. But uh, um, is there further point or purpose in the committee engaging with yourself on the issue? I'll, I'll certainly remain open-minded. My, my call to you would be, can I see any evidence as to have the statistics in any way been misused that I should have sight of? Because as I understand it, there are benefits of a, a clear understanding of statistics being reported in an informed way. So yes, if the I, committee I think, I think has the another issue, view, then I need to see that evidence. The issue may not be one of misuse of statistics, but rather um, openness and public trust. But I think the committee can discuss this further and perhaps um, come back to you, um, and we'll see where we take that. Um, but I think that's probably as far as we can take this but discussion today. Yeah, although, although clear we answer, could, convener. Well, um, as I say, the committee can discuss that and... Uh, We'll um, see what we make of that. Thank you very much for coming in today. I'll suspend the meeting and uh, allow it to allow a change of changeover of witnesses. Welcome back to our meeting this morning, and we now move on to our um, discussion of the proposed public-owned energy company. 
Uh, one of our witnesses, Catherine Wadhams of the University of East Anglia and the UK Energy Research Centre, unfortunately is unable to be with us today due to um, travel not working out. So I'd like to welcome those who, who are here, um, starting from my left to right, Ragni Lowe, Principal Knowledge Exchange Fellow, Centre of Energy Policy of the University of Strathclyde. Neil Barnes, Deputy Director of Consumers and Markets for Ofgem, and Kate Morrison, Energy Policy Manager for Citizens Advice Scotland. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you for coming in today. And I'll turn, first of all, to John Mason for some questions. Uh, thanks, convener. And uh, it was to start off with really with the role of a potential uh, publicly owned energy company. And we'd, it was actually Professor Wadhams had made some interesting quotes, uh, including there's a danger that conflicting and or poorly defined objectives result in poor achievement of any of them. So I was just wondering if you could give us some comments around this area, what the key strategic priorities should be uh, for such a company. For example, tackling fuel poverty, supporting renewable generation, supporting community energy schemes. Does there need to be a narrow focus or can we have a wider focus? Who would like to start off? Um, I should say there are no need to operate buttons. That will be done by the sound desk. So, Ragni Lowe, I think. Yes, I'll, I'll give it a, a crack. Um, so, I think uh, when the proposal was initially made, um, the uh, intention had been, this is way back now, 18 months or more ago, that this would be something that would um, support the strategic objectives around energy generation um, and decarbonisation as much as anything else. We've changed focus now, as I've set out, I think, with the committee before, um, for this to be much more about consumers and fuel poverty. Um, and I think if that is the case, that's a laudable uh, aim. Um, if that is the case, then, as Catherine Bottoms has suggested, that, that goal needs to be quite tightly defined. And some of the other things that are still at play around local energy decarbonisation um, and, and sort of strategic oversight maybe need to, um, to take a step back. There is a lot going on already on fuel poverty, though. So if this is going to focus exclusively on fuel poverty, then um, it will need to be very well aligned with existing, um, well, the fuel poverty definition bill and action that's proposed under that, the um, requirements on local authorities to develop local heat and energy efficiency strategies and um, the actions already being undertaken by many government partners on fuel poverty. Um, so alignment with that will need to be um, kind of at the heart of, of how this thing evolves. So there are other objectives that could um, be, be addressing, but I think I would agree with Catherine that it needs to have a, a more narrow focus now that we've got to the point of actually pulling forward kind of concrete proposals as to how it would look. Thank you. Mr Barnes, do you want to? Sure. So, uh, Ofgem, obviously the regulator of the gas and electricity markets in, in Great Britain. I think we support many of the, the aims of the Scottish Government in, that they've set out for the publicly owned energy company, many of which match our own duties. For example, around trying to drive down customer bills uh, and support vulnerable consumers. And um, you've seen our recent proposals to introduce a price cap, which particularly help reduce the bills of consumers who haven't engaged, <coughs> many of whom may well be vulnerable or in fuel poverty. So I think there's there's a good match in terms of those aims. Ultimately, we, we're looking for a, uh, a retail market that's well-functioning, where competition can benefit all consumers um, that enables innovation and um, new new technologies to come to market, uh, and particularly one where consumers who don't engage, particularly the vulnerable, are also able to benefit from that competition. Um, so perhaps a couple of, of observations. Obviously, there are, there are already a wide range of, of players in the in the retail energy market. I think 60 or, or so energy suppliers active in the Scottish market alone. Um, but there do seem a lot of opportunities for um, new new entry into the market to deliver uh, different objectives, particularly scope for innovation based on new technology, new data that's uh, becoming available with the advent of things like smart metering uh, and just new new markets, new ways of transacting. So to that extent, we 
uh, we're very much welcoming of uh, new, uh, new entries, new business models, products and services that can provide better value to, to consumers. So um, I say quite a lot of the, yeah, I think share a lot of the objectives of the Scottish Government in that endeavour. I, I wouldn't have a specific view on quite um, whether they're the, the right ones for um, that sort of venture. Okay. I mean, you, you talked there about we want to have a well-functioning market, which I'm sure most of us agree, agree with. Um, is, I mean, is it well-functioning at the moment? Because one of the problems seems to be that especially vulnerable people poor off are not switching supplier, which is one of the kind of key uh, factors in all of this. I mean, do, do you think, I mean, if people aren't changing at the moment, another supplier, would, would that possibly make them change or...? So the market isn't functioning as well as you should do at the moment, as evidenced by the fact that we, well, the government has decided to introduce price regulation, and that's something we uh, made our proposals on recently with a view to introducing a, a price cap um, from the 1st of January next year, which stands to benefit consumers to the tune of around a billion pounds. So I think recognise the market isn't working well. There's a lot of uh, initiatives we're enacting to attempt to improve competition in that market. Even when the price cap is, is in across the market, there will still be significant savings available for consumers who, who do engage and do switch in the market. The price cap itself will at least uh, um, ensure that consumers that don't engage are not being ripped off and that they're paying at least a, a reasonable price for their energy. Okay. Ms Morrison, do you have any thoughts about how narrow or how wide the focus should be? Yeah, I think that we would uh, quite strongly support the objectives that were laid out in the uh, most recent version of the energy strategy, so with the focus on uh, on tackling fuel poverty. Like over a quarter of Scots were in fuel poverty as of 2016 figures. We know that um, there's been significant price rises since 2016, particularly in the electricity market. So, um, yeah, I think we would want a specific emphasis on trying to tackle and alleviate fuel poverty through cheaper um, energy bills. And do and you think such a, an organisation as we're talking about could do that in a more strategic way by just kind of helping people and helping them understand what's going on better or should they actually be in there playing themselves? Yeah, it's a difficult one. I think there's a huge lack of awareness. So we did a recent survey um, in Scotland and it showed that up to 10% of some suppliers, customers don't even know that they can switch. So there's 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 obviously a huge amount of awareness raising to, to go to, so to kind of um, identify and <coughs> to, uh, to reach the fuel poor and the people who are vulnerable. But um, I guess our view is that if it contributes to getting to the fuel poor, then it's a it's a good thing. Whether it's going to be the, the single solution to doing that is, is another question, I guess. Okay. I mean, assuming that the company was to actually a sell a electricity or gas or both um can, do any of you know how what kind of level of customers we, they would need to have in order to break even and to be viable because presumably if there's too few it just wouldn't work is, is that something any of you can comment on i'm not sure there's a kind of magic number there what we've seen from the 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 many companies that have entered the market particularly in in recent years uh, is that there are a range of different business models out there, some that uh, aren't, are not looking to grow particularly big and um, aiming more for niche bits of the market, whereas others are looking to achieve scale relatively quickly and some of the economies of scale that come along with that. I think what we do know is that below certain customer numbers, um, very small, that can be quite difficult to actually compete effectively, particularly in terms of accessing the wholesale market mm -hmm. on a, on a cost-effective basis. But I think that's relatively small numbers. Of customers there. Um, beyond that, I think it very much depends on quite what the, the business model of the company is, how cost efficient they can be in terms of their operations uh, and other factors like that. Okay. I was just going to say, uh, in, to reinforce that, that, there are costs that are associated with tipping over certain thresholds in terms of scale. You would imagine that a Scottish uh, government supported energy company would wish to take on many of those costs, things right, like the warm homes discount, um, which is targeted at supporting fuel poor households. Um, so those costs might well be assumed to be part of a smaller company, um, irrespective of thresholds. Mm -hmm. OK, well, thanks. Uh, colleagues will explore some of that further. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, should, the, should this company 
be involved directly in the supply of energy. Is that the correct role for it? Right, well, I can um, kick off. My understanding is that the, the Minister has now written to, um, I think, the committee, in addition to others, to suggest that a white labelling arrangement, and we can maybe discuss what that is in a bit more detail, but that that is the preferred option that's been taken forward um, to development of a proper business case, um, which would, I suppose it's a hybrid between directly supplying and, and not, <laughs> uh, somewhere in between. Um, and it offers a number of advantages in terms of, sort of de-risking the venture. Um, whether supply, I mean, I think as, as Kate has suggested, um, there are multiple ways of addressing fuel poverty if that is the objective, um, providing low cost energy, if that can be done given the margins in the market by running a supply company is one of them. So um, it can be a part of the solution um, if it's designed well uh, and the thing is designed for success. Am I correct in saying, and I think I read this in newspapers, that there's a 5% margin on supplying power? That, that, that's the, the profit margin? So we require the large suppliers to publish on an annual basis their uh, accounts in relation to their gas and electricity um, activities. And I think the, yeah, the, the average margin on gas and electricity retail in recent years has been around 5%. Uh, interesting, that's uh, made up of probably 8 or 9% on the gas side and almost nothing on the electricity side. But that's looking at the six large companies. Obviously, uh, given the rate of new entry and the rate of switching in recent years, smaller companies now account for over a quarter of the market, uh, which is very positive. We don't have the same level of visibility over the, the profit margins that they're making. Anecdotally, um, relatively thin. I mean, in some ways, you'd expect that from companies that have just entered and are looking to get up to speed. Um, so whether you think 5% or, or so is, is an attractive margin, um, interesting question. Uh, Neil Barnes said that uh, there are 60 existing suppliers in Scotland, which seems an awful lot. Where, where would this company fit in in that? I mean, there's 60, 60 suppliers competing at the moment. And some of the smaller ones, presumably, are seeking to establish themselves in various niches in that market. Now, now, now we were proposing to have another company come in and try and establish itself in its niche. What we see in terms of the energy market at the moment is a, is a part of the market that is very competitive, where consumers are engaged, willing to shop around. There are a lot of options, a lot of choices, and uh, relatively low prices available for those. Uh, what we also see is a part of the market where consumers don't engage, and they're paying considerably higher prices. So uh, there's potentially a role for a supplier that can reach uh, those parts that the other bits of the market aren't serving so well and engage those consumers um, and potentially save them um, considerable amounts of money on their, on their bills. So... Um, I think that's 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 one factor to the extent that there may be bits of the market that are not being particularly well served or targeted by existing players in the market. I think another observation, just that the market is going through a rapid change at the moment. So while a lot of those existing players are focused very much on what you might think of as traditional supply, so selling kilowatt hours of gas and electricity to to customers, the the opportunities afforded by, as I mentioned earlier, new sources of data coming from smart metering, new technologies, be it storage, electric vehicles, uh, new ways of trading, local energy, peer-to-peer -peer trading, uh, mean that we, we expect to see significant innovation in current times, and whether that comes from existing players in the market or potentially uh, players who are not currently in the market, um, that remains to be seen. So we, we very much welcome uh, further new entry to the extent that that brings with it a better way of supplying energy or, or innovative ways of, of doing that. Do you think the Scottish Government's phased approach with local authorities is the best way to launch this company? Um, I think it makes sense to do it in a phased way. Um, what and, and for, for a number of reasons, not least um, that the, the state of the market 
and the, the amount of flux and change in the market means that it, it would be very difficult um, to do anything else in, um, in terms of sort of financial and accountability and um, risk. Um, for me, though, the the phase approach still has to have a sense of the the end point that we're heading towards, and it's not clear that. Um, and we talked about the, the range of objectives that may be being served simultaneously. It's not clear to me yet um, whether the end point is still trying to address a, a large number of um, objectives simultaneously in, in a way that, say, an energy agency might be better equipped to do than a than a supply company. So the sort of what happens after the white labelling arrangement, I think, is is still an open question that that needs to be considered. It may be that the white labelling arrangement is is it, and in fact. Um, this is this is what happened. This is you know th the white labelling um, model um, is the supply side uh, entity, and that other things then flow, but that don't necessarily sit under that arrangement, and that there might be um, you know investment in renewables, for example, addressed through a different mechanism. Um, but what that all looks like, I think, would be useful at this stage to start at least to set out. I was just going to add to that that. The two councils that operate um, this kind of model already are Bristol and Robin Hood, and I think the jury's out as to whether it's really a sustainable model. The Bristol Council said they'd spend 33 million on the venture. This, uh, Bristol Energy's already spent 27 million of that, and they're not profitable yet. So it's, uh, for me, I read um, Sadiq Khan had planned to do the energy for Londoners uh, white labelling, or sorry, he was either going to set up an energy company or a white label, and they commissioned Cornwall Energy to do a scoping study, which is better, the white label or the setting up a complete supply company. And I think they double-weighted timing so that the, the white label was the one that was chosen, but in fact, the setting up of an actual supply company was going to deliver better on um, revenue retention, more control over tariffs, tackling fuel poverty, generating um, like economic benefits like jobs, etc., um, getting higher customer numbers, supporting renewables in the area. So the white labelling model, I think the devil will be in the detail, like how they plan to do it is obviously is the most important thing, but that just raised a little alarm bell for me as to why, why choose that option when there, there's evidence to suggest it's maybe not the, the initially going to get the best benefits. Do you see a role for the the uh, National Investment Bank? I have to say, I don't have a specific comment on that. I, mean, I think there is in, in the energy sector generally and, and um, around investing in both the generation side in terms of low carbon technologies um, and projects, but also in local energy systems that match supply and demand um, through projects that aren't just about you know putting new bits of kit in, um, but how that links in to the, the public energy companies, again, a, a bit of an open question. So there is a role, but... Right. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks <coughs> very much, uh, Convener. I um, just want to explore a little bit about the um, community and, and local energy um, sector, where there's been quite a bit of success, but there's also remains huge challenges. Um, mainly in terms of investment, and the Scottish National Investment Bank may have a, a role to play that, but also in relation to fuel poverty, which is high in rural areas, particularly in off-gas grid areas. And in terms of resilience, we've seen islands like the island of Egg build its own generation capacity, and yet there's only 80 people live there, and, and um, uh, re repurposing that in, in 10 years' time or so will be quite a task for, for 80 consumers. So I'm just wondering whether there, there are um, is a role for a public energy company uh, in alliance with investment vehicles like the Scottish National Investment Bank, providing grants, loans, equity, guarantees, etc., to try and build, to assist in building resilience um, in those areas where uh, the um, the energy supply and indeed generation is, is most challenging, both for price and for uh, resilience. Um, does, uh, yeah, okay. um, we do see you know, a lot of interest in in local energy schemes, not just in Scotland, but more more generally. Um, I think a lot of thinking and investment going into those sort of areas. Uh, obviously, that's a slightly different model to what we've seen generally. So there are ways in which the current market arrangements don't always uh, facilitate the, the uh, 
uh, some of these innovative new business models or, or ideas, and that's something we're at Ofgem looking at actively in terms of how we might adapt the rules to enable a greater range of business models, be it local energy or other types of, of trading. Um, so I, you know, I think it definitely seems like that's a, a direction of travel for, for bits of the market, whether it, whether it uh, makes sense um, everywhere. Interesting, interesting to, be, to be seen how that, uh, some of the experiments we're seeing at the moment work out in terms of um, how well they engage consumers in the local area. I think there's some positive signs in that in that sort of area, um, but more broadly, how how well those sort of, sort of schemes can actually deliver cost savings for the local area, drawing on uh, local generation and other things. I mean, I mean, say the market doesn't work. The market doesn't work at all uh, in that respect. We had a you know a state-owned energy enterprise 30 years ago. It's now been privatised. It's owned by mm. big multinationals, and it's focused on generation, distribution, um, and supply. Uh, and yet, at the same time. We have, as you say, new innovative models. We'd, we've been looking at district heating, for example. Some of these are early stages, but we've had uh, demonstrations of how they can apply, not just in this country, but in other countries. And it seems to me that the reform of the energy market on, on along conventional lines about price controls, etc., is not going to make much impact on the need for resilience, not just in rural areas, but in, in, in parts of urban Scotland as well. Um, and that innovation needs to be supported. Now, may, maybe this talks to more a, a, an energy agency than an energy company. I, I think it does, um, or, or indeed to a range of different policy levers that some of which don't aren't uh, under the purview of the Scottish Parliament. Um, so, so yes, I think um, this takes us beyond just thinking in terms, certainly, of the white label arrangement that's that's being proposed at the moment. Um, I think one way in which, uh, under the current arrangements and, and in, in um, devising a, a white label arrangement model, um, that this some sort of support, as you're suggesting, might be possible is through power purchase agreements. Um, and those can, in the current market, they look like they look because of the sort of drivers in the market. There may be a role for um, a publicly owned energy company. Um, to, to pursue power purchase agreements that are slightly longer term and have a, more of a sort of social um, objective to them. But that's not an area I'm an expert on and I don't know, you know what that would actually look like in practice in terms of the, the current rules of the game. Okay, thanks. Just, sorry, just add a little, I'm just gonna add one bit. That just, I suppose for us, there's specific groups of consumers like those who are reliant on electric heat pay on average about three times as much to heat their home as they would if they had gas. So. Um, whether a, a supply company could simply offer enough of a saving to make it worthwhile for that, those kind of groups of consumers is probably questionable. But the, um, yeah, if they could perhaps get them onto different systems like district heating, or is that a better solution? Then I think yeah, the, the outcomes for consumers may be better if you're thinking beyond just uh, slightly cheaper tariffs and into what other options are better placed in that home. Right. Um, I just want to ask about um, how this affects the policy approaches of the Scottish Government if we add in yet another energy company or another um, aspect to the, the situation. Is that likely to assist in delivery of the objectives that the Scottish Government has policy objective-wise, or is it likely to overcomplicate matters? Try that one. Um, I think... The, the proposal, as I understand it, to be um, that local authorities would be invited into a, a kind of an umbrella white label arrangement. So the Scottish Government would effectively procure um, a, a supply package on behalf of local authorities that they could then choose to take up. Um, if if it aligns with what local authorities are wanting to do and their, their wider energy policies and, and energy activities that they might already have in terms of energy supply company or energy services company, sorry, um, then that's all to the good. But I, I suspect what you'll end up with is a, is a sort of patchwork of some local authorities um, engaging in that and others not um, because it doesn't, they don't necessarily feel it aligns well with their objectives and with their current activities. Um, so if it can be designed in a way that supports um, as many local authorities as possible in, in uh, their endeavours to reduce fuel poverty and to um, increase energy resilience locally, um, then that's good. But it, 
uh, I think that's that's the area that it can help in terms of the way that it's framed at the moment around um, engaging uh, with the idea of local energy systems. Um, and that doesn't seem to me to cut across anything else that Scottish Government is trying to do. So that seems to be a sensible approach, um, it, but it does just address kind of one part of um, the, the kinds of objectives that we've been talking about. Um, Kate Morrison and Neil Barnes. Um, I was just going to add to that that the, the sort of the the risk of it with policy is that it, the application is patchy, so that you know not everyone is benefiting. There, there, a, a question is if you if your objective is to reach fuel poor uh, customers, we have done some recent research where we spoke to people in fuel poverty, and unsurprisingly, they want instant financial support with their bills. That's that's what they need. Um, so there's like a model in Ireland where you get a winter fuel allowance if you're on a specific benefits over the long term. So is, are there other ways of consistently reaching the fuel poor and lowering their bills, which means that you actually access everybody instead of um, uh, you know, whoever signs on or, or that? So the concern for me would be it may be useful in forwarding some of their policy objectives, but whether it's going to reach everybody that needs to benefit from those. Right, and Neil Barnes? So, one thing we do see, we talk a lot to a lot of innovators, potential entrants to the market, uh, who have uh, different ideas, different business models they want to bring. And in an awful lot of cases, they they don't start out with the intention of becoming a licensed energy supplier. That's not really what they're interested in. That comes with a lot of obligations attached. Um, but they ultimately find that, given the the current uh, structure of the market, they either end up needing to seek a supply license themselves to particularly to gain access to industry systems and data um, or they end up need to, needing to partner with an existing player in the market to do that so and that that suggests in the, in the uh, in the current market model there there can be benefits to being a, a licensed supplier to enable them to do certain things um, accessing the the wholesale market for example um, and accessing customers as I mentioned previously we are looking at ways in which we can update those market arrangements to recognise uh, how, the, how the market is likely to evolve and make it perhaps less, um, either less burdensome to become a, a licensed supplier or to make it easier to provide some of these innovative services without having to, to go through that hoop of being a licensed supplier. Thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Um, we, we touched upon earlier that uh, retail energy uh, margins are really tight, about 5%. Um, and most electricity and gas is sold through the wholesale market, um, and that's predominantly dependent on supply and demand, not necessarily reflecting the cost of production. So do we know what the margins are for generators? We, again, we get the, the six large supply companies to publish their mm -hmm. generation outturns. Now, of course, some of them are uh, less... Uh, Less involved in generation than they used to be. It used to be that they were all uh, vertically integrated in that way. Um, I think the the margins differ very significantly. Uh, I think one of the players, particularly that's very involved in the nuclear side, uh, makes the vast majority of the profits in that area. But clearly, they those six large suppliers no longer represent the entirety of the generation market. So I think it's it's less clear to see what. Would, would uh, it be fair to say that it's substantially higher than five percent? Um, in terms of return on investment, yes. You'd expect that in a, uh, a capital-intensive sector like generation compared to uh, retail. Again, whether 5% whether margin on retail activities is, is tight is an interesting question. I suspect there's some retail markets that would consider that a very healthy return. Um, it depends on your perspective. So uh, if this uh, publicly-owned energy company wants to make a difference, should it be getting involved in generation where the margins are larger and therefore there is more scope to um, support people that are struggling to meet fuel bills? I don't have a view on, on whether it's worth them getting into that bit of the market, I don't know. Anybody else? I think it's a good idea to get yeah. involved in generation. It seems logical that it would um, have greater benefits, but obviously then you've got the higher risk of investment, so it's whether that, um, that, you know, that plays out for you. What do you think those potential risks are? 
Well, it depends um, if they're what technology they decide to invest in. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be any kind of economist, but I, I, I know that there's a lot of um, suppliers failing in the market of late. You know, it's not it's not a necessarily an easy market to, to, to be in. So I guess it must be there's, there's a lot of high risks. There, there is a lot of, um, as Andy Whiteman already touched on, there's a lot of um, small scale um, electricity suppliers, uh, certainly more constituency as Harlow Hydro, that's been on the go for a couple of years. They are small scale. Is there is there a need for um, a publicly owned energy company to through um, power purchase agreements to actually engage and, and give these small scale um, producers or generators uh, a, a market that could be used to focus on people that are fuel poor? I can come on. I think yes, potentially there is. Um, as I say, that that may not be something that can be delivered through the white label kind of mm. model, certainly initially. Um, but but yes, there is definitely scope um, for that kind of support, um, and indeed for you know for investment, as we've already discussed in terms of um, National Investment Bank, for example. We, we touched upon earlier Bristol Energy, but Robin Hood Energy, I believe, has just turned a profit for the first time since it was established. Is there any lessons that could be learned from either Bristol Energy or Robin Hood Energy uh, in order to help us in setting up this new publicly owned energy company? Anything I would add on from, um, we rank uh, suppliers in a supplier league table quarterly, so it's based on not their not their costs, but on like their um, their complaints levels, the how easy they are to get through to on the phone. And I think Bristol did pretty well. They're sixth out of thirty two that we've uh, got in the specific uh, parameters, but Robin Hood are twenty ninth. So you know maybe they're offering a wee bit cheaper, but you know you would hope that this, the the publicly owned energy company would be really focusing in on good customer service and all, and all of the other things that come with it if you're particularly trying to uh, attract vulnerable consumers or those in fuel poverty you don't want to move someone and then have their standard of service drop okay thanks so much um yes yeah, certainly neil bound mm -hmm. not to say lessons that could be learned from those but i think it's um interesting to note some of the different approaches that they have taken for example, in engaging consumers. So Bristol Energy actually has physical shops that people can go into. I think quite a lot of consumer research that's been done suggests that um, some confidence need, some consumers need that extra uh, hand-holding confidence to be able to engage effectively in the market and make decisions. So they've clearly uh, used that. I think most, <laughs> most suppliers, uh, you, yeah, you, you won't see a physical presence um, it'll be on the telephone or online. With Robin Hood Energy, I think they initially focused on prepayment customers, I think as part of a sort of social objective. So I guess it shows that those sort of city council run suppliers are able to um, target different segments of the markets in, in different ways and have tried different things. May I just add one very quick point? I think the other example is our power here in mm -hmm. Scotland, which, which also has a, a, a kind of explicit policy of um, addressing those in social housing that are being moved from one contract to another and intervening at that point to give them a better deal. Thank you. Uh, a supplementary from Jamie Helgo Johnson and then Dean Lockhart. So yeah, it was, it was just uh, quite I, You mentioned there were 60 suppliers. How many of those are uh, not for profits? Uh, I thought you might ask that. I mean, we don't, so we don't um, formally kind of log whether they are or they're not. In some ways, it's, I suppose there's different interpretations of what that might include. I think we, we've heard some examples of, of those. I'd say it was almost certainly a significant minority of, of those. Um, of course, not-for-profit doesn't necessarily mean cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they're not aiming to make a margin, um, but whether or not they're cost-effective. So I think of, of the not-for-profits, you see some may be at the cheaper end of the scale, some may be at the higher end. Yeah, I appreciate they might, they might be trying to provide an additional service, whether it's public, uh, you know, customer service. Um, I was just going to ask, um, what's the difference between the, I don't know if anybody knows the difference between the kind of average um, fuel cost, whether it's electricity or gas, and the lowest available cost? Is there a fairly consistent, uh, you know, gap between, in between the two? So over over recent years, I think the, the average difference, so the difference for an average consumer, so one who consumes uh, average level of um, gas and electricity 
difference between the most expensive and the cheapest on the market has been around £300 in those um, circumstances. Obviously, for people who consume more, that, that could be higher, and it's remained at around that sort of level. Um, Ofgem is planning to introduce its price cap from 1st of January. That will, uh, on average, provide savings for consumers on the, the poorest value tariffs of around £75 a year. Um, resulting in savings of around a billion pounds. That in itself will still leave scope for those consumers who do want to shop around and engage in the competitive market to, to save significant amounts. So just very quickly, would, would that not suggest that perhaps the focus should be trying to encourage those that aren't engaged in you know, shopping around for price, maybe helping them to get onto the lowest towers rather than just obviously the price gap, the, the, the price freeze is going to um, uh, you know, play a role, but would the focus not be best spent on actually making sure that everybody who needed to be was on the lowest tariff, tariff available. Absolutely, and we've been putting a lot of effort in, in recent years to uh, better understand what's stopping consumers from engaging effectively in the market. And we've done a lot of research and a lot of trials recently of, of different ways of engaging consumers, some of which have been very positive. So one we published only quite recently was a uh, what we call a hassle-free collective switch. So we uh, asked one of the big suppliers to... Um, uh, if we could use about 50,000 of their customers who hadn't switched for around three years, so a reasonable proxy for people who may not be uh, making a conscious decision to be on a poor value tariff. Uh, we used a price comparison service to run an auction, get suppliers to bid a low price in for those customers. Uh, and in the event, a, a quarter of those customers ended up switching against a baseline of you know, around... Uh, three or four percent who on average would have switched out of that sort of group. So um, that's just one example of where I think there is significant potential to engage more consumers. Um, I think it was a, an important learning from that, the extent to which consumers valued tele being able to use the telephone and actually mm -hmm. talk to someone rather than just being expected to, to deal online and, and make those sort of decisions. Um, I think we'd recognise that that's sort of very necessary to continue promoting engagement, but perhaps not sufficient, you know, there would always like to be some consumers who, for whatever reason, don't or can't engage in the market. And the, and the, the price cap is a, a temporary solution for improving their sort of outcomes. Longer term, we are committed to exploring ways of um, changing the arrangements in the market to try and improve competition, enable better innovation, and hopefully deliver better outcomes without some of the downsides that could come with, with setting prices. Okay. So on a local grassroots level, to you know, we have 60 cab um, in Scotland, and we run a project called Energy Best Deal, which gives people one-to-one -one sessions to make sure they're on the, the the right tariffs and that they're they're you know they're they're accessed all the correct support. I think last year we had 38,000 energy issues come through um, the network in Scotland. We managed to save clients 1.6 million pounds in financial gains, which just shows you like how many people could actually be saving money. It's it's it's, yeah, it's a, I guess it's a real shame that. that people aren't just on the cheapest tariff available to them. Yeah, that's maybe where the Scottish Government's focus should be then, you know, in the first instance, actually looking at the, you know, the reductions that are available already and focusing attention on trying to get people onto those cheaper tariffs. Yeah, I, I just don't think there's a single answer. I think that, the, you know, that they are focusing on doing that. They support the Energy Best Deal project and Big Energy Savings Network and other various other projects that do attempt to do that, and they do have success, but you're never going to reach everybody with a single thing. And I think that there, there is a role for the supply company, um, and perhaps it could be tied into these kind of local awareness. You know, if you've got a local tariff that's really good for people in your area who are on prepayment meters, um, then get the Energy Best Deal project to make sure that that's clearly advertised to people in that area. So there's probably, yeah, can it tie in with what, what else is going on? Dean, Dean Lockhart, sorry, I perhaps moved to Dean Lockhart. And okay, thank, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, in order to achieve uh, a meaningful impact on the market and make a difference to consumers, presumably the energy company will require scale in terms of uh, being able to influence the market and, and uh, uh, influence price, which in turn will require significant investment, both setup costs as well as annual running costs. Presumably, we're looking at tens of millions of pounds. Um, from a policy perspective, is, is this the best use of public sector money to address fuel poverty? Or does the panel have views on, because some of those in need may not be, this company might not reach all, the, all of those in need, is there a better way to use public sector money to address fuel, fuel poverty? 
I can start on that. I think um, the white label arrangement, that, as I understand it, is, is sort of on the table now, avoids those large setup costs that you're describing. Um, so I think is a sensible um, first step, potentially, and then ultimately doing something that, that looks more like a standard supply company or not. And as I say, one thing for me would be to understand what, you know, what happens in phases two and three of this. Um, and that, so I think uh, a white label arrangement, if it can be designed in a way that matches what local communities need, uh, then that seems to me a, a, a pretty sensible approach. To Do other panel members have a view on that? I think there's there's quite a lot going on in this area. The the powers over warm home discount and um, eco have moved potentially to Scotland. Um, so there's pots of money that could be used for targeting um, support to fuel poor. There's also all the stuff going on with the fuel poverty strategy. So I don't know. I don't want to make a new policy position for my organisation off the, the hoof, but I think, I think there's definitely um, yeah there, there's definitely I I certainly like the Irish model of having this winter fuel allowance that people can. Um, you know, if they're in fuel poverty or if they're in uncertain benefits, they're definitely getting a certain amount of money over the winter to make sure that they can actually heat their home. Thank you. Uh, one other question on a slightly different topic. We've heard mention of other companies in the rest of the UK uh, in terms of um, addressing uh, price, uh, fuel poverty, and uh, hoping to reduce uh, pricing for consumers. Are there other examples in the rest of the world that you can point to where state-owned companies have been, been successful that possibly we could uh, learn some lessons from? Um. Obviously, the, the UK or the GB um, energy market is a quite a different context to most other um, energy sectors. Um, and so there, there aren't kind of directly comparable examples. Um, I th a lot of play is made of um, the ways in which Danish and German, for example, municipally owned companies have succeeded in um, delivering local investment, local jobs and uh, good prices for consumers. Um, but those tend to be, uh, as I say, those companies exist in a, um, a different type of market. Many of them, in spite of being publicly owned, do um, compete in a um, more or less liberalised market. Um, but many of them also are involved in not just um, supply of electricity to households, but in heat and in district heating and actually generating and, and supplying heat, um, which is something we haven't really touched on. But obviously heating your home is... Um, is usually the kind of chief reason that you might be in fuel poverty rather than um, the need to have have your lights on. Um, so something, I think there are lessons to be learned around how um, not just the state, but, but um, not-for-profit companies might be involved in provision of heat. So um, I think it's fair to say energy markets tend to be set up quite differently in, in a lot of different jurisdictions. Um, I wouldn't have a view on what, which ones necessarily delivered better against some of these aims, but I think there are some clear differentiations. So, for example, in a lot of the Scandinavian markets, objectives around uh, vulnerability and fuel poverty are dealt with outside of the market through the, the social security system. So, um, I think one of the defining f features of the British market is the the the, the the volume of obligations we put on energy suppliers mm. to be delivered through the market in terms of loft insulation and warm home discount and some of those things, um, which um, is clearly one route and that those companies have existing relationships with their customers. Uh, it also has the potential to um, I suppose make that a harder market to, to enter. Mm. If you're coming in, you, you need to be performing a very wide range of, of things, uh, of, of activities which you know could put off a... Uh, company that's looking to do something quite specific and, and clever. Uh, as Ragnar said, in in many uh, European countries, you do see more public ownership based around municipalities uh, and other issues. That in itself can have issues around competition. It perhaps has developed less well in some of those countries. So I think there, there's pros and cons. Um, yeah, I think it's certainly not all of the things that energy suppliers are currently expected to do have to be done by energy suppliers. There are potentially different ways mm. of doing that. It's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Angela Constance. 
I would like to explore the governance arrangements for any publicly owned uh, energy uh, company. And I wondered if the panel had uh, views about uh, where the principal accountability uh, should, should lie. Should uh, any company be principally uh, accountable to parliament uh, or to government uh, or, or, or to both? Is the committee structure of this parliament uh, adequate and, and suitable for uh, scrutinising and holding to account such a, a complex organisation? And is there any basis uh, for the accountability arrangements to be set out um, in legislation? What do you see as the arguments for and against that? Um, I don't think we have a specific view on whether legislation is required or not, but um, in terms of a model that we think works, just because we work quite closely with Scottish Water, is that um, you know they're publicly owned, they're effectively um, accountable to ministers in that their high-level objectives are set every six years um, the, over, I think it's called the principles of charging and the ministerial objectives. Um, there's a whole kind of structure of uh, governance that goes around that with WIC, SEPA, um, all these different organisations that ensure that certain elements of, the, of their priorities are delivered on. So that for us is, it seems to be a really exemplary model for a publicly owned comp company. Okay. I don't have a view on, on what suitable governance arrangements would be. I think from the perspective of the regulator, clearly if a publicly owned energy company wanted to seek a licence as a supplier, we would obviously be the body that uh, considered that and granted that, and we'd want to be clear as to you know, what the entity was we were granting that licence to so that we could hold them accountable um, and regulate them. And um, you know, we would be treating a publicly owned energy company in the same way as any other company we regulate um, monitoring compliance and enforcing that in the same way as we do in order to protect consumers. Um, I mean, in terms of governance, it might well be instructive to look at some of the existing um, uh, local authority city council owned models and see, obviously that's a slightly smaller scale than a, a Scottish government uh, run company would be, but to see how they've addressed some of those issues and also how they've um, addressed potential concerns around state aid and the way in which such companies are funded. Thank you, Ms. Lowe. Yeah, just um, I would agree with both of those points. Um, certainly, learning from existing models of governance from uh, the from Robin Hood, for example, and Bristol Energy, which took a slightly different approach, um, and the lessons that that um, came out of that would be good. Um, on legislation, I don't have a view, well in, enough informed um, view. I think the only other um, example uh, we might point to is the way in which. When um, Statoil, the Norwegian energy company, was established, um, its requirement to report to Parliament um, might be something, in terms of transparency and accountability, um, without necessarily assuming that um, Parliament would sort of be the, the ultimate, ultimate body to which the, 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 the company would be accountable, but that it should um, be required to report to Parliament in terms of um, its business and uh, objectives and how they're being met. Okay, so we've heard about um, you know the, so some of the local examples in terms of the uh, Robin Hood companies south of the, the, the border. We've heard of um, some of the arrangements in and around uh, some of the, the, the larger uh, national uh, companies that are on, 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 on the continent. We've heard that you know there might be some learning from, from Scottish Water. I suppose um, not just thinking about accountability but also thinking about uh, service user involvement and um, you know promoting and protecting the rights of consumers uh, but also in ensu ensuring that the voice of those most affected by fuel poverty are heard and uh, integral in that lived experience is integral to the working of a, a publicly owned uh, energy company. Um, I wondered if there were any other examples that we could also be learning from in terms of you know, proper, meaningful, participative uh, user engagement. Um, well, I, I, there, there are models of um, citizens' panels and deliberative um, participatory processes being used to, to support design of services um, in, I mean, this is not an area of expertise for me, but in terms of health and um, social services, for example. 
uh, which could be drawn upon um, and multiple um, ways in which um, service users and or citizens, depending on how we want to characterise them, have been involved in um, supporting decision making. So, you know, in terms of participatory budgeting as an example of a process mm. that involves, directly involves those recipients of um, public services in the design of those services. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there, there are multiple different kind of models that we could draw on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Morrison? Well, I would just add that you would hope that as the consumer representative, that they, as they were forming this um, company, they'd be able to draw on our expertise and, and research to, to understand what consumers want and need from this kind of company. So it's something that we're planning on doing in this year's work plan is, is speaking to consumers about it. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps more a question for, for, for Ms Morrison, because I, I suspect, given her uh, role in uh, Citizens Advice Bureau and uh, research, she'll be more familiar, perhaps, than other members of the panel with uh, Social Security Scotland and how that organisation has been set up and how it uh, rather innovatively uh, taps into um, a, a, a service user uh, experience. So I'm quite keen to canvas opinion on you know, a range of bodies, uh, either in Scotland or across the UK, or indeed the continent, that we could really be learning from? Um, I have to say that would be my colleagues. Um, I could feed back on that as to what they're, they're, they think the learnings could be from, from Social Security Scotland. OK, thank you. Thanks. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in today. I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow a change over to our next panel. Thank you. Um, welcome back to our meeting. Uh, with us we have Graham Fisher, head of the uh, branch, the Legal Directorate, Constitutional and Civil Law for the Scottish Government. David Farr, Policy Manager, Corporate Insolvency for the Accountant in Bankruptcy, and Alex Reid, who is the head of Policy Development. And we're looking at the Insolvency Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2018. Um, before I come to other committee members who may wish to have uh, to ask questions about this, I just want to clarify one thing. Now, we know that we're looking at the question of leaving the European Union and the technicalities that that will involve, not just with regard to insolvency regulation, but other areas. And also that there's a, a protocol for obtaining approval of the Scottish Parliament where the UK Parliament exercises or UK ministers exercise powers uh, over areas that are within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. So my question, uh, I just want to focus on this issue. My understanding of the protocol, and correct me if, if it's differently understood by yourselves, is that um, if the Scottish Government, supposing we accede to what's before us um, today, if the Scottish Government were not to be happy with what is eventually brought from the UK level, uh, the Scottish Government can bring that to the committee and to the Parliament. Indeed, a Scottish statutory instrument could be um, issued and agreed by the Parliament. Uh, on other occasions, there may be a slight alteration in what uh, the 
the Scottish Government had understood but considers it not to be material, in which case the Scottish Government would be content with that. Uh, or another, the third possibility is that the, the Scottish Government may be entirely content, and in that case it's simply, uh, I think, laid before the Scottish Parliament. Uh, the concern or the issue I want to raise is the, the issue of this committee uh, not being in a position then to scrutinise, should it choose to, or review what is then being put forward by UK ministers in relation to what are devolved powers or competences, because it would appear on the basis of that protocol that the only time it would come back to the committee or potentially to the parliament to review is where the Scottish Government was not happy with what was coming from UK ministers, whereas if it was, effectively, the scrutiny would be simply not possible, except, obviously, from the point of view of the Scottish Government. Now, ha have I understood that correctly, or um, is there another way of looking at that? Uh, I don't know if Graham Fisher would like to... Yes, I, I, mean, I believe you have understood the, the protocol co correctly. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think it would be open if it, if it was helpful for the government to, to write to the, to the committee with a copy of the, the regulations as laid, if that would assist. Could that be done? Uh, could that be? <coughs> pardon me. Could that be done on the basis the committee could then um, take action in regard to the regulations or um, raise issues with them? Uh, Certainly, I mean, it would be open to the committee, of course, to raise any issue it, it, it believed was was of concern. I think it, it would be difficult in terms of the the process and the the overall process in terms of the timings for laying the Brexit legislation uh, across the UK. If uh, to, but it, you know, of course, it's you know, it'd be for the Parliament to to decide what uh, what view it took of of uh, of the the final position that that was reached. Uh, at Westminster, but uh, you know, of course, the you know the protocol does work on the basis that if the committee is content with the the proposal that the the matter be dealt with by UKSI, then it, the the Westminster Parliament would would look at the the matters uh, before before the Westminster Parliament. And and if 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 for example there were a procedure whereby the Scottish Government um, put the draft SI to this committee for comment. Um, uh, uh, would the Scottish Parliament then, if this committee made comment or specific comment on provisions that it was uh, thought should be drafted di differently and that were not being dealt with elsewhere, would it be open to the Scottish Parliament to then um, uh, not agree to that? I, I don't think there's a formal role in terms of the protocol in, in terms of disagreeing to the the instrument that would be considered at Westminster. No, I suppose in that in that sense, it would ultimately be for the UK government to decide what what recognition to take to take of any views that the Parliament might express. But but certainly the the, the committee could be provided with a copy of the of the instrument that's taken forward at Westminster if that would if that would help the committee with its consideration of the of the instrument. Right. Well, I, I may or may not come back to that. Uh, would other members of the committee like to raise any issues? Andy Whiteman. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, this is quite a complicated area of policy and quite a complicated area of um, of legislation <coughs> as well. Perhaps you can just clarify um, the proposition that the UK uh, legislate in this area is designed to address both the prospects of a deal and the prospects of no deal, is that correct? At this moment in time, the, 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 um, the plans that have been made are based on a contingency for a no deal Brexit and the deficiencies that would arise in that and uh, the most appropriate way to deal with the, the issues that span com competence and, uh, and that would be complex or difficult to deal with um, using another route. Um, so this, um, the piece of work that's before us just now is, um, is, is basically dealing with that contingen contingency on a no deal um, and that situation would need to evolve and reflect any deal if, if a deal were reached um, with the EU covering cross-border insolvency proceedings. So just to follow up on that, the, the instrument that is developed would not 
have any effect if there was a deal. Is that the case? The uh, certainly the, the the position on the instrument would need to evolve in the t in, in relation to the terms of of, of a deal, um, 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 because the instrument deals with specifically what would need to happen in legislation and the deficiencies in legislation on the basis that there is no deal and that the EU regulation as it stands doesn't have that um, a reciprocal arrangement across um, EU, um, uh, EU states. So there would need to be um, a development that would need to, to uh, correspond to the, the nature of a deal. So is it your preference from a policy perspective that a deal should include an agreement that basically retains the status quo in terms of cross-border cooperation? I think it's safe to say that we share the UK government's view, the Scottish government's view, is that the, the, there are advantages to the, the cross-border arrangements and uh, the reciprocal arrangements that, 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 that exist in insolvency, um, and that from a policy perspective, um, it would be um, desirable that, 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 that those arrangements would um, continue um, post-Brexit. And so far as you're aware, um, any negotiations on continuing these arrangements along the same lines as exist just now, are they, are they negotiations that can, could lead to a, a positive outcome or are they contingent on other, um, other aspects of the deal around trade, for example, and services? I think the, 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 the draft withdrawal agreement anticipates that, uh, that, that for example, existing insolvency proceedings uh, would the, 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 the recognition and the cross-border um, cooperation and recognition that exists would continue after uh, brexit but that's still subject to the negotiations um, that that are ongoing and at this moment in time I don't think we've got any particular certainty on the the continued um, uh, the, the continued um, reciprocal arrangements that, that are agreed. And what we're dealing with just now is a contingency arrangement to uh, enable the continuity of domestic law in the event of a no deal uh, Brexit where those arrangements do not um, continue to exist. Is it worth me saying something more, maybe just to, to distinguish that there's the withdrawal agreement, which is in draft, of course, and is, is available and that has provision for the transition period and the implementation period. Um, and it, there would be a process for it, UK government's published a white paper where you know it sets out that the um, that there would be a withdrawal and implementation bill, which if there is a deal and, a, and an agreement on the withdrawal agreement, it would provide for that implementation period. So the provision to be made in the no deal SI would then effectively be deferred to the end of the implementation period set out in the withdrawal agreement. The, the wider negotiations and, the, and the, the future partnership paper, which, uh, the, which the UK government's also published and set out its uh, desire to, to reach that, that wider deal with the, with the EU is, uh, is where I suppose these arrangements would be maintained in the way Alex has mentioned it, it would be the, the policy uh, preference of the Scottish Government along with the UK Government to, to maintain those arrangements. Uh, uh, you know, at present that's that's not not yet be, uh, been agreed and that would be agreed as part of that, that wider partnership. Um, and I think it's a, you know, it's a desire of the Scottish Government and the, the UK Government to, to reach an agreement on, on that. Uh, you know, at, at present the the, the EU uh, saying that's still up for, for negotiation and that the wider aspects that you, you mentioned they might come into to obviously whether or not there's a, a deal can be a, can be agreed as part of that. And finally, how, how clear um, was the accountant in bankruptcy and did the Scottish Government that this proposal should be uh, allocated to category A as opposed to B or was it a, a marginal decision view, not a decision? Uh, I, I don't think it, it would be classed a marginal um, decision, um, based purely on the the arrangements that have been put in place in other contexts to deal with that difficult area, particularly of company winding up that spans competence with the general legal effect of company winding up being reserved and the process of company winding up being devolved. Um, 
thinking of practical ways to deal um, with that. Uh, um, and we have previous examples of where this approach has been taken. So in terms of looking at the approach, um, it seems that it's the it, it, it's really the, the the only feasible approach that that that, that, that can um, result in in legislation that 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 may, 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 is effective for the user of that legislation and is not trying to deal unpick those issues of reserved and devolved competence in separate instruments. Um, so I think in terms of that approach um, and in dealing with this particular situation. Um, I, I don't think we had any doubts about um, the category that that, 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 that that fell into. Okay, thank you. Jackie Bailey. I wonder why you didn't consider, or maybe you did, um, the issue of separate Scottish legislation in areas where there was clear responsibility. So, for example, personal insolvency and receivership. Um, you've legislated before yourselves in Scotland. Why are you passing this responsibility on to the UK government? The, 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 the draft instrument and the approach is not to have those um, issues covered in UK legislation. The plan would certainly to be to, um, to address those deficiencies that relate to purely devolved matters within a Scottish statutory instrument. Okay. So when would we expect to see that? Because I'm conscious you, you know, this isn't the only instrument that, that maybe the accountant in bankruptcy needs to deal with, but I'm sure Mr Fisher um, is ageing rapidly when he considers all the instruments that, that need to be brought forward. So I'm interested in teasing out you know, how you're going to manage this. We have already... Um, undertaken work to address the, the deficiencies and, and uh, plan what needs to happen in Scottish uh, legislation. Um, in terms of the, the timing for the development and laying of those legislations, that will uh, need to take account of other Scottish Parliament priorities mm. that come along and, and indeed the, the impact of not making that, that SI. So I think that really needs to be taken in the context of Scottish Parliament priorities. Um, uh, but there certainly would be no difficulty in in bringing that legislation forward um, within the, the bounds of those priorities um, uh, in advance of, of or well in advance of, of Brexit. Sure. I appreciate how difficult it is to speculate, but but I'm kind of interested, obviously, in in unintended consequences. If we didn't legislate quickly over the areas of devolved responsibility. Um, what would be the likely impact? In devolved, in, in the areas of devolved competence, um, the, the, uh, I don't think there would be a significant impact because in the areas of person, personal insolvency and receivership, uh, there are not high volumes of cross-border activity. That's certainly fair to say. Um, receivership, uh, receivership appointments are diminishing um, the, the receivership action is, is raised by a floating charge holder and the floating charge um, would, would need to emanate from before 2003. So in the, in the last two years of receivership, there have only been six receivership appointments in Scotland. So they are few and far between and, 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 and even fewer of those would, would involve cross-border insolvency. And certainly in personal insolvency, there are very few cross-border. So, um, so I think that... that uh, the impact is likely to, 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 to not be significant, but that's not to say that, the, that we would uh, need, we need to, uh, to address the deficiencies that are created, certainly in an ordeal scenario. Okay. I wonder whether I could explore with, with Mr Fisher. Um, we were told there's something in the order of about 100 SSIs, legislative consent motions taken as a package. Um, how many are we asking the UK government to run with? Um, and how many of those are we legislating for? I appreciate it's a bit of blamange at the moment, but but it would be useful to get an order of magnitude. Sure, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have the oh. have the figures and the breakdown eh, myself eh, to hand, so um, we would have to um, to to give you give you that information later if that was, that was possible. That would be very acceptable. Thank you, convener. John Mason. Eh, thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I mean to continue that 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 kind of way of thinking. Is this subject of insolvency? unusual in that it is kind of so intertwined between Scotland and the UK that it does make a lot of sense for one, i.e. the UK, to deal with it. I mean, is that unusual 
are there a lot of other subjects like this? Well, if I, if I take that one, I suppose I, I think it's safe to say that, that it is unusual, um, particularly because the C2 the reservation in the Scotland Act is particularly difficult when it comes to corporate insolvency and in particular the, the area of winding up where the process of insolvency is devolved, but the general legal effect of that kind of insolvency, I should say, is reserved and, th and that leads to particular difficulties, but uh, there, there certainly are other areas of uh, of regulation where there are there are mixed areas, say, I mean that that's it's relatively common in particular areas and and in EU matters. Obviously, there's a, a practice of using Section 57.1 of the Scotland Act in some cases to allow those very mixed areas to be dealt with on a on a a more straightforward basis. And that's something that I know this committee has considered in the context of insolvency in the past and relation to you know that mixed area of winding up, in particular in approving the Scotland Act order, which would allow the, the corporate insolvency rules to be to be made um, together with a, with the UK government, uh, and you know for that there's a project to replace the corporate insolvency rules that's ongoing at the moment. So um, so so I don't know if I can I can say yes to yes to both no. sides of that. Um, so. That's, that's fair, thanks very much. I mean, just as a general comment at this point, uh, I mean, I, I would say I share the convener's concern that what the committee has been asked to approve something, but I mean, I totally accept that is not your responsibility, uh, but something that we haven't really seen. And my final point would be we had a briefing from R3. Now, their concern seems to be that if we go down this route and there's no deal, that UK practitioners would be kind of recognising what people in the EU are doing, but there's no guarantee that... EU practitioners would be recognising what we were doing in the UK, and that would put the UK at something of a disadvantage. Is, is that a fair comment from them? Well, I think um, the, the, the I think that to, to a certain extent, the the the, uh, the arrangements that we put in place um, would allow for there there to be. Uh, is it, well, maybe Graham could defer to the SI, but on recognition, um, uh, would 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 EU insolvency procedures be recognised here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I mean that's part of the provision that's that, yeah. that would be made in the, in in the SI. I mean, I, th I think broadly we would agree with R three and and, and what uh, what they're saying about the potential impact of of the of the of Brexit. Generally, and how how that could, you know could it, it's it's those reciprocal arrangements falling down that could put people in Scotland at, at a disadvantage. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, if there's no further questions, then I will uh, allow you to go back to the blamange of EU <laughs> directors and I trust it doesn't age any of you too much. Thank you for coming in, and we'll suspend the meeting, move into private session. <laughs>